63. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, I'll take a privilege and rearrange a couple of items here. Uh, we'll move items four and five uh, up above number three, if there's no objection. Without objection. Uh, so we'll go right into the reading of the appeal statement. Pursuant to the provisions of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law judicial writ. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering the appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. Mr. Secretary, do we have a quorum? We do. With that, then, uh, Mr. Secretary, can you present the, min the minutes for approval? Were those distributed? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the minutes have been distributed. Are there any comments or corrections? Move that be approved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Don't excellent, finish. excellent job. <laughs> I, I mean, seriously, I, I read them tired, you know, in detail and very well done. Thank I, you very much for I being just, very detailed. I just that. finalized a staff draft. So I'll take a little that, credit that, for that. That, that was awesome. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, that takes us to uh, public comment. Is there anyone from the public here today who wish to come before this board to make comments? Is there anyone here today coming for public comment? Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment before this board. Hearing none, we move along. Uh, I just would like, in my chair's remark, to welcome our returning board members, uh, uh, Mr. Wynn and Mr. Witzel, who I'm sure uh, uh, is, is probably on his way, I haven't heard, but I, I trust that he is. And we uh, certainly appreciate your continued service and dedication to this very important cause that we're, that we're all working towards. Thank you very much. Forward to and also like to thank staff uh, for uh, the replete, the complete, and I say detailed package that, that we receive uh, each and every month, uh, keeping us uh, moving our, our, our issues along and, and that kind of thing. And then finally, to assure those of the public uh, that this board and its constituency are working tirelessly uh, to make sure that the Charter Amendment rights that were voted in 2018 by a two-thirds majority of the people of Nashville and Davidson County remain intact. Having said that, we go then to uh, our PRRs, our proposed resolution reports, which are again complaints and the resolution, recommended resolution of complaints that have been lodged by citizens of Nashville and Davidson County of police misconduct, uh, alleged police misconduct. And I'll turn to our legal resource advisor, uh, Daniel Young. Uh, just a question, Chair. I think you were going to do number three. We, we skipped it. We were moving four and five ahead, but we haven't done three. Uh, thank you, Mr. Young. I appreciate that. That takes us back to item number three, board nominations. And I'll turn that over to the nominations committee chair, Mr. Walter Holloway. Mr. Holloway. We had a meeting uh, on the 15th, uh, the nomination committee, and we did come up with a slate of names. And uh, those names are, as the chair, Mr. Whistle, first vice chair, Alicia Haddock, second vice chair, Joe Brown, and uh, secretary, Drew Got Godrich. Okay. Um, I'm gonna ask, each individual, do you accept your name being as a candidate for these positions? And if you oppose, we will uh, eliminate your name. But at the same time, um, after we do that, uh, you do have the right to nominate yourself uh, for, the, for those positions. You can nominate yourself or someone else can nominate you. Okay, Mr. Miller, do you accept being chair? Uh, no, a candidate for being chair. 
Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, first vice chair, uh, um, Alicia Haddock, uh, do you accept being a candidate? I accept. Okay. Second vice chair, Mr. Joe Brown, do you accept being a candidate? Yes. Okay. And the secretary, Ms. Uh, Drew Godrich, you accept? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, before the election process. I'd like to do, excuse me, can we make a, a point of correction? When you first mentioned the, the for, so that we have this done properly, um, when you mentioned the first, uh, who was, for the chair, you said Mr. Witzel. So was uh, it, was it? Mr. Milliner. It, so was it Mr. Milliner? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. as the point of correction is noted on the, on the, um, on the record. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Mr. Witzel was on my mind. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, we will um, clear all of the positions right now. No one has a position. I'm the scrumming person in this house. So um, I would take charge with uh, a line um, nomination for the chair. Is there a nomination from the floor? Okay. Since there's no nomination from the floor, we'll close with the said name, Mr. Milliner. Okay, first vice chair, Alicia, uh, first vice chair, is there a nomination for the first vice chair? I'd like to nominate Michaela McCree. Who? Michaela McCree. Okay, we put our, her name down there. All right, is there a, uh, Anybody else for the second, for the first vice chair? Okay, well, I'll close with the two said name. Uh, second vice chair, is there a nomination from the floor? Okay, um, Mr. Whistle is not present, but he did make it clear to me that he wanted to, to be a candidate for that position. Anybody oppose? Okay, uh, we will close with those two said names. Uh, secretary, is there a nomination from the floor? Okay, we will close with the said name. Now, we will start the uh, voting process. We have two position that are unopposed, so each one of them can automatically just vote for themselves and we don't have to go through the whole process. And that's the first one would be the chair, Mr. Milliner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I, I, I make a motion that we uh, ex uh, cast one unanimous ballot on the one said name. Okay. Okay, what about uh, secretary? Yeah, that, I'm sorry, that, that should be voted. That, that should be voted? Yes, sir. Okay. All so right. you have to call for the vote on that. Now, let's go for you the have vote. To call, I'm sorry, you need to call for the vote on the second for the chair position so that everybody uh, gets a chance to accept that nomination for casting one unanimous ballot on the said name. So it's all in favor. That's not how I do it, but... Um, oh, okay. My turn. My okay. Turn. Now, <clears throat> whenever you want all, to do it. <laughs> uh, thank you. All in favor for those, uh, the casting of the one vote for the chair and the secretary, uh, say aye. Aye. In a poll. Okay, the ayes have you. Now, let's move forward to the first vice chair. Uh, let's see, a show, hold your paddle up for... Uh, Alicia Haddock. We got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, the next person is um, McKee. Is it McKee? McCree. McCree. Anybody? Else? No. Did you get these two? Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Holloway. If yes. I if I may, I only. Recorded five uh, paddles, but my 
I'm being told there might have been more. Could we do I that again? I can't see uh, Let's we recount. Thank you. Let's try that one Just more time. Just enough time to actually record all the votes. Let's hold your panels okay. again so we can see them. For? For uh, the Haddocks. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I apologize. I wanted to put the names. Yes, we want to <laughs> so I'd need enough time if everybody's going to hold their paddle up for me to actually record all the names. Except for the first vice chair. For first vice chair, uh, there have been two nominations, one for Ms. Haddock and one for Ms. McCree. So people are indicating by holding your paddle up that you're voting for Ms. Haddock. Okay. okay. So I have Mr. Goddard, Mr. Brown, I have Mr. Wynn, I have Ms. Haddock. I have Mr. Turner and I have Ms. McCree. Okay. All Which right. And, uh, and the next person, Miss uh, uh, for Michaela, do I show show your belt. You can't vote twice for this. Uh, I, I thought you had your belt. <laughs> your first time. Okay. We show pal um we show one. Yeah then. We, have an, we, we must have some, we must have an abstention. Okay, um, it, it, it shows that um, for the vice chair, um, Ms. Haddock has six and, and Kayla has one. So, so. Okay, now let's go to the second vice chair, uh, Joe Brown. Okay, we got one, two. Hold your power so you can see it. Got one. Just a point of order, because uh, I don't think all the members are here when we, we announced it. For second vice chair, Judge Brown was uh, a nominee, and the second uh, nomination was for Mr. Witzel. So there are right. two nominations, and you, you've indicated if you, to raise the paddle for Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, uh, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And I see Mr. Brown's vote. Uh, Mr. Goddard's vote, Mr. Milner's vote, um, Mr. Turner's vote, and Ms. McCree's vote. So how many we have there? That's four, Your Honor. Uh, four, sir. Okay. Now, uh, Mr. Whistle. That's five. Let's count the votes there. Everybody hold your battle up. Ms. Spencer, uh, Ms. Haddock, Mr. Wynn, and Mr. Holloway. Was, you said four, but it's five. Brown, Milner, Turner, McCree. I'm not Goddard. sure. And, and Goddard. Goddard. I apologize. That was a majority vote. We didn't need to do the second part, but I, I miscounted. Okay, we had what, five for, for Mr. Brown? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> that's complete the election process. So what we have um, as our chair, Mr. Milner, uh, First Vice Chair, um, Ms. Alicia Haddock, and Second Vice Chair, Mr. Joe Brown, and then the Secretary is Drew Gottry. And I'm sorry, I, another question, uh, Chair. I, I heard a motion made for a unanimous vote on the chair position only, and then I, I know that at some point somebody said chair and secretary, but honestly, the only motion I heard made was for the chair and it was seconded by Mr. Goddard. I didn't hear a, a motion for both chair and secretary. Mr. So chair? I could be wrong. Okay. Mr. Chair? Go ahead. I'd, I'd like to make a motion to cast one unanimous ballot on the one said name for the position of secretary. Okay. Okay, it's been properly uh, voted on for the uh, voting for the, the one vote for the secretary. For uh, which uh, secretary will be uh, Gotch, Drew Gotcher. Now, uh, everybody in favor? Say aye. Anybody opposed? Uh -huh. Aye. Okay. Well, the ayes have you. The um, for, so our first vice chair will be Miss Haddock. That's uh, six votes, and uh, second vice chair. It's uh, Joe Brown. Um, everybody in favor of the, of the first vice chair? Is it aye. Approved. 
I don't see any reason why you can't approve the already decided vote. Okay, great. That, aye. Uh, anybody opposed? Okay. And the uh, second vice chair was uh, Joe Brown. Everybody favors aye. 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 So that's, uh, that's complete our election process. Um, and uh, as, as, like I said, our chair, Mr. Milliner, first vice chair, Ms. Haddox, mm -hmm. second vice chair, Joe Brown, secretary, uh, Drew Godfrey. Okay. That's a complete election process. Thank you very much to you and your team, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I know that it wasn't uh, a smooth ride. Uh, it took a couple of meetings, <laughs> uh, but I think that everyone now is satisfied uh, and hopefully yourself that the process worked the way that it should have worked. Yes, it worked like uh, we thought it should be uh, because um, we were looking at the chair on position where you completed a term uh, of, a, of, a, of a former chair in which ended January 31st. And so that's the reason why we completed the, the, uh, the whole process and started so when we had a different election at a different time of the year, unless somebody happened to, happened to have to resign or someone had to leave to go for some employment or whatever, you know, but we're on the same page at this time. I, I appreciate that. And I just turned to our legal resource uh, advisor and, and just to confirm that uh, even though I completed the term uh, for our previous chair, that this is my first full term officially. This will be your first term coming up. And it, so there would be an opportunity if, if, if this board so desired for me to have a, an additional term. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That moves us to the, uh, <laughs> I think I'm in the right place now with the proposed resolution reports. Now, keeping in mind that uh, when complaints are of, of alleged police misconduct are filed uh, with the Community Oversight Board, uh, the investigation takes place and findings are made and, and then the recommendations associated with those findings are presented in the form of a uh, proposed uh, uh, resolution report. And so we have two on the agenda tonight. Uh, and keeping in mind, this is the heartbeat of what the COB is all about. Uh, and I will turn it over to Director Fitcher and, and or any designee she may have uh, to take us through. Okay, good afternoon. This is in reference to MNCO complaint CC 2021-031. The, the allegations of misconduct against Officer One are number one, obstruction of rights, number two, adherence of, to policy and rules, uh, vehicle towing, and number three, deficient or inefficient performance of duties. Um, I am going to be sensitive about this case because it does involve a minor. Um, on June 1st, 2021, the complainant filed a complaint with the Metro Nashville Community Oversight um, Board alleging that on May 31st, 2021, a Metro Nashville Police Department employee, um, we call Officer One, wrongfully arrested the complainant's minor daughter after the complainant's daughter was involved in a single vehicle accident. The complainant further alleges that the Officer One called a tow truck or a zone wrecker to the scene after the complainant had already done so, um, incurring her an unnecessary and additional expense. Um, May 31st, 2021, the complainant also filed a complaint with the Office of Professional Accountability. Um, and we have reviewed that and audited that um, particular um, case. 
Um, so the findings of fact are um, on May 31st, the, complainant, the complainant's daughter was involved in a single vehicle crash. Um, the, daughter, the, the complainant's daughter called the complainant who arrived and called her insurance company. Uh, she did that um, immediately um, when she uh, had contact with the officer um, and said that she had uh, contacted a tow truck and they were on their way. Um, as and she was uh, the insurance company called a tow truck as a complainant spoke to her insurance a nearby neighbor arrived and called 911 to report the accident. Um, the emergency call center received a phone call from the neighbor at the same time at 1:59 p.m. because the mother um, was on the phone with the insurance company. Um, after the complainant conducted her phone call with her insurance she approached the neighbor to inform him that her daughter it was her daughter who had been involved in a wreck. The neighbor informed the complainant that he had already called 911, um, which made it unnecessary for her to make the same phone call. After driving her daughter home, um, because she waited on the scene for um, 30 minutes with her daughter in the car, um, and as her daughter um, began to feel anxious and um, emotionally unwell, um, she said that it, she made it necessary to take her home, which was approximately two miles away um, because her daughter was distraught. Um, and then she returned to the scene to wait for the tow truck. Um, when the officer arrived on the scene at 3.11 p.m., more than an hour after the, the original 911 call had been made, um, and before exiting his vehicle or speaking to the complainant, he called for a tow truck. Um, when Officer One does speak to the complainant around 3.13 p.m., the complainant told Officer One that she had called for a tow truck and that it was on its way and that she had already prepaid for it. Um, Officer One, um, he did not cancel the tow truck that he requested. What he said was, well, I hope the chores get here before ours and you know, the one that he had called. At 3.16 10 p.m., Officer One went back to his vehicle and made a phone call to a more senior officer. Officer One explained the details to the other officer, and the other officer relayed his opinion that the complainant's daughter had not violated any law. At 3.21 p.m., Officer One called a former Metro National Police Department employee who had moved on to work for another police department. And during that phone call, Officer One stated incorrectly that the complainant didn't want to have a report made. Officer One said, the complainant even tried to say, well, we don't need a report because you know she's okay. A review of the body-worn camera footage shows that at no point did the complainant say that she didn't want or need a report made. Additionally, Officer One wrote in the accident report, the owner was also very adamant that she did not want a report to be made. A review of the body-worn camera footage does not demonstrate the complainant at any point saying she did not want a report being made. When the complainant's daughter returns, Officer One informed the complainant's daughter that she would be receiving a citation. Officer One went back to his vehicle to complete the citation paperwork and realized that he could not issue a citation due to the age of the complainant's daughter and the fact that the offense was a traffic violation. So instead of, instead of exercising discretion to issue a warning, Officer One requested another officer be dispatched to the scene because the complainant was going to act a fool. Of the incident, the complainant stated, this incident will forever change my view of police. I had always thought more police were there to protect, to help, to serve. Instead, Officer One caused more psychological trauma to my daughter when she was most vulnerable, still shaken from the accident. And I will say that in this accident, there was no injuries um, to anyone um, and that the car um, was off the road. It was not blocking any traffic. And um, there was a fire hydrant and the fire hydrant had slightly been, had slightly been bumped and was leaning a little. Um, and so um, Officer One not only failed to obtain the necessary information to ascertain whether the complainant's daughter violated the law, he actively misconstrued the information he did not have when talking with other officers, approximately five different people he spoke with, um, and what action to take. For example, he repeatedly told officers and wrote in his report that the complainant was trying to avoid a report being made. He also misstated and allowed other officers to misstate that the complainant was unaware police had been called and she just happened to still be on the scene when Officer One arrived, which was not accurate. Um, so additionally, the MMPD manual requires that vehicle owners be allowed to make their own arrangements for a tow truck in the circumstances that were presented. Both the complainant and daughter were visibly distraught by the improper and off unlawful actions of Officer One. 
When a minor is arrested, they are handcuffed with their hands behind their back, searched by the officer, placed in the back of a patrol vehicle with the doors locked from inside, and transported to juvenile detention, where they are subjected to the booking process, which although later expunged, is part of a federal database not visible to the general public. Mediation was not offered in this case based on the nature of the complaint. And after review of all of the evidence, um, I conclude that the allegations of obstruction of rights, adherence to policy, and deficient performance of duties against Officer One are sustained. So the recommended action here is obstruction of rights is a category B offense, um, a first violation of which is typically disciplined between eight and 13 days suspension. Violation of adherence to rules is generally a category D offense and typically disciplined between one and four day suspension. For a violation of deficient performance of duties, the category varies by severity of offense. A review of Officer One's disciplinary file revealed a one day suspension in 2020 uh, for negligent care of government property after a vehicle crash in his patrol car. I think there was two of those actually, one in 2020 and one in 2021 for the same things. Um, the OPA investigated and made a finding against Officer One for deficient performance of duties without recommending any disciplinary action. For the allegation of obstruction of rights and adherence to rules by way of violating the vehicle towing policy, the OPA made findings of not sustained. Since Officer One was not disciplined for either the obstruction of rights or the adherence to rules violations, um, I recommend a 13-day suspension for obstruction of rights and a four-day suspension for adherence to rules, as well as a written reprimand for the deficient performance of duties as a Category E offense. And that concludes um, complaint number CC 2021-031. I'll take any questions. Board members, <clears throat> discussion. I see Mr. Turner, uh, I see Mr. Goddard, Mr. Turner. Oh, yeah, for just for clarification, was the mother on the scene of the crime? I didn't get that clarity. Was the mother, the mother was on the scene after the incident happened? The incident, excuse yes. me. Yes, and then she, she um, only left the scene um, to take her daughter to the, her home, which was only a few minutes away, um, about five minutes away, um, because her daughter was feeling ill. Mr. Goddard. All right, this was going to be a tad odd. I, I took the time had the time it took the time to look at um the this is based largely on an opa report office of professional accountability within the police department long extensive interviews um that is something we can read it is confidential with respect to the the general public at this point um i'm i am significantly more outraged by the conduct having read that than what i read here and i talked to daniel about this i, I mentioned it briefly to jill Staff was, Daniel and staff were concerned about identifying the juvenile and juvenile becoming identified, whatever else, when this became public. And while the juvenile's name would be redacted, their expectation was that the mother's name would not be, the complainant's name would not be. And therefore, they just didn't want to trade anywhere near the actual arrest charge, things like that. I would like to suggest, and I think I need a motion, I'll make a motion, have the board first, if they agree, to, to get out of that conundrum. Uh, suggest that for this one, we redact the names of both the mother and the daughter with a footnote at the first redaction indicating they are both redacted because it, one is a juvenile and to identify the mother would in effect identify the juvenile. So moved. Or second. So mm -hmm. I will move that in, in a second. Uh, it's been moved and properly seconded that the complainant, who is the mother, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, the daughter, who is a juvenile, uh, that their names be redacted from any future reports. Uh, before we have any discussion about that, I'd like to turn to our legal resource advisor and to make sure yes. that we're on really good ground here doing so. Obviously the motion in the second and that can take place. The only concern is that if a public records request comes through and is litigated, I'm not sure that it would withstand the redaction if it was taken to court. Obviously we can redact it. We can, we can do what we can to, to, to protect the anonymity. Um, the only statute uh, of concern is uh, one regarding the, the General Assembly's um, expungibility for juvenile records. Um, we're not meant to put in any information. So I would still caution that we not talk about that. On the other hand, 
what the complainant reported to the MNCO is a public record, and much the same information is, a, is available from both sources. So I think both her name, you know, we will redact it if the, if the board so moves and approves it, and um, just be aware we may not be able to withstand a, a, a subpoena or records request asking for that information anyway. Thank you, Mr. Yoon. All right, uh, any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I see Director, I'm uh, sorry, Board uh, Member Haddock. Okay, so Director Fitcher, can you give a little bit more context of when that, um, the arrest took place? So I see where um, the officer stated that the complainant is going to act a fool. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Board Member Haddock. Uh -huh. uh, there's a motion, a specific motion on the floor at this time that we have to, we have to get adjudicate that. Out that. The way. Yeah, get that out the way. Ahead. But if you have something that's on this motion, you definitely have the floor. Go ahead. I apologize. Okay. All right. Any any further discussion on the motion? Um, hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. All right. So move. So second it. So voted. And let's uh, make that happen. I'm sorry. Okay. Now, board member had it. Please. So from the time that the officer stated that the complainant is going to act a fool, and then where did we go to the arrest? Okay, so because it involves a juvenile, I'm gonna be very careful with what I respond to. So what I'll tell you is that when the officer says he's talking about acting a fool, he is saying that to other officers who are, that he's calling to get um, support, is what I would say, um, to make this particular arrest and you know to determine whether or not it's lawful whether it's not lawful and really trying to decide what to do um and even when people say well that's not or officers say well you you know i wouldn't do it or you know it's these are the different issues that are in the law um that discretion could have been used um he continues to make calls until he finds um a person that might support his um his stance. Um, so the mother and daughter, uh, the mother's on the scene um, and he, she goes to get the child to bring her back to the scene. And um, so it, there, she's there for an hour and a half before, you know, do, doing this whole process waiting for him. And so there is an arrest made. Um, I can't tell you the exact amount of time between when he's talking to five different people, asking them all these different questions um, until the arrest is made. But the arrest is made shortly after she arrives back on the scene. In regard to the citation that he was um, advised not to write by one of the officers that he called. I, I was, so so it, it, it appears here that he was, um, he called someone and they said that they would not write a citation. Like this is not what we want to do. But then it leads to an arrest. Right. So there, there is an arrest mm -hmm. instead of a citation issue. Okay. Board Member Goddard. Yeah, sorry, thank you very much. The, the motion was so I continue in this vein, knowing that, barring losing a public records request, that the identity of the juvenile, either directly or through the mother, is not gonna appear in our final report. Um, I, as I understand it, and I'm asking for, for staff to correct me if I've missed some of this, this officer got to the scene, concluded that um, violations of law had occurred, called first an officer that wasn't even with Metro anymore, that went somewhere else because, I'm sorry, you're shaking no, uh, called various people. He, he got clear direction that no crime had occurred from one or two of them. He called his sergeant, his direct superior, and didn't ask that question. He asked about a hold on towing the car, didn't ask his direct superior whether this was a violation or not. He also concluded that because it was addressed in a state statute, which surprised most crimes are, he didn't have any discretion. If he thought a crime had occurred, regardless of all circumstances, he had to take action on that, couldn't just give a warning. He then read, and I still don't understand why this policy reads this way, that the, the issuing of a citation 
uh, was not allowed for a juvenile traffic offense. So he viewed himself as based on that, having to choose between just a warning or arresting the juvenile and concluded that because it was in a state statute, he didn't have any ability to give a warning. He had to arrest this person. It was cacophony of errors, and he knew he had conflicting information most generously to him, did not call a superior and ask what to do, and wound up arresting um, a juvenile, um, handcuffed, back of the car, taken downtown, if I'm understanding right. I mean, just a, a, a bad, bad result. And the statute, uh, sorry, the, the rule on obstruction does talk about knowingly, but at some point that person, that officer knows he is arresting someone and he does not know if a crime has occurred. He does not know that he has the right to do that um, and didn't take the actions to, to get there. And on that, I, I firmly support the finding that he obstructed rights. Complicating that is the fact that his report makes several incorrect statements, which individually, none of which is, is completely ruinous of this situation, but taken together, create a report that looks much more like he was justified in taking some action than was in fact the case. Um, and the incorrect reports or false statements in report or whatever, I think I'm looking at, at Daniel and I'm sorry, at the legal officer and executive director, I think is one of those categories that allows pretty broad range and consequence based on the surrounding circumstances. Is that right? Or am I misremembering that? Sorry, which part was that? <laughs> was uh, the, 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 the violations of having false statements in a report, the, the range of consequence for that, the category, for lack of a better word. There's two or three different policies that it implicates. The one that talks about false statements is really meant for OPA interviews, not for the, what's written in the written report. But there is a written report. It does allow for a well, lot of my, my inaccuracies. Wrong phrase, but that's what I'm getting at, something in a report. Yes, sir. Um, I offer that as my reaction and, and hopefully of interest and in education of the other board members. Um, what to do with this, um, I think, is for, and by the way, this officer has, has left the force. We don't know if he's gone somewhere else or not, but he's left the force um, without much consequence at all from, from OPA in response to all this. So in terms of this officer, you know, we can follow up with that. In terms of this process resulting in very little consequence from OPA, I do think we need to have uh, a report that indicates how severe, if you guys agree with me, I think this is. How, gosh, I tried and I couldn't find the answer and I arrested him anyway, it just isn't good enough. If under policy that's okay, we need to have a change in the, the policy, um, in my opinion. And, uh, and, and recommending, I'm fine with what Jill the executive director has recommended. I would like to see, this is all to get to the point of, I would like to see this report rewritten with significantly more of those facts stated. Um, I don't necessarily want a sense of absolute outrage, but a strong statement that we do not believe this is how it should work. And if this is consistent with policy, we need to have a discussion with the chief about that. I'm not talking about the long process, no offense to you, Gavin, of a full-blown analysis and this and that, but just a sit down, what does this mean? How can this situation be okay or not that big a deal? Sorry for the length of that, but I... Um, I'll, I'll turn to the legal resource advisor uh, on, on the uh, issue of the rewrite, uh, if you will. What does that look like and how do we... Well, it would that? be a case of first impression. Uh, I'm not opposed to doing it. And again, what we... This is the... The PRR is the outward-facing document that the public views. The investigative report that I think Mr. Goddard and Mr. Brown have, have looked at is sort of our inward looking one. I will say that uh, because of our process and procedures, our PRR, our resolution report, which you have in front of you, and our investigative report, which does include a lot more detail and analysis in it, both of those go into the OPA file. That's sort of one of the things that other departments and people can ask for um, and obtain. Uh, and we, we're sort of pushing a little bit in our negotiations about um, how often or whether it's mandatory that they receive this investigative report and resolution report. But that being said, I just want to put that out there for the board to consider that what we put in our resolution report is an outward facing document. One of the reasons we made it a little bit more sparse this time around was because we were uh, trying to be sensitive to the future of the, the, the young person involved. And I understand the, um, the redaction for both individuals uh, by the board. Um, 
but that's sort of why we made a decision we did to keep a lot of those things in the investigative report um, and which could still be obtained by um, other outside agencies if they ask for ask for it um, but the resolution report we didn't the board will have a chance to weigh in on what it wants to recommend as far as this report is concerned I can add a, a few a little bit more context um, as I listen through some of it um, the I thought what I think is important here is that um, repeating this episode um, having to relive this was very traumatic um, to the mother as well as to the child um, the daughter was very upset um, she stated the officer wasn't friendly um, he refused her mother to speak to her when she was in the car um, that he rolled the window down ever so slightly her mother was extremely distraught that her daughter was um, in the back of a police car um, handcuffed and um, listening to the child speak about her experience um, that she began to feel very ill she was very confused um, she was hyperventilating um, the mother stated that it was another officer who told her where to pick her car up she didn't even know that as her daughter was driven away and she didn't even know where juvenile the juvenile detention center was um, that she didn't get any information from this officer um, and that you know and that she felt like he did not show them any respect um, and that he caused psychological trauma to her daughter. And so uh, I, I just you wanted to kind of give you that information. Uh, we, we have board member Brown and board member Holloway in that order. Board member Brown. Oh, I thought Mr. Holloway was up first. Oh, well, I, I saw your paddle first, but yeah. you would yield, Mr. Holloway. It, um, it seems that um, he was acting more like a Brit than she was. Um, you know, either it, a cram or not, and uh, that's what a supervisor for. If he's not able to make that decision, you got you to be straight with your supervisor, you know, instead of calling different ones because uh, you work under his supervision. You know, you calling other people, you know, they can't really vouch for you because of anything go wrong. How can they stand up for you? But you, at least you can rely on your supervisor saying, you know, I work for him. He, uh, he's uh, he's uh, in my command. And uh, he should have been straight before, you know. And uh, if he w had made clear to him that there was no arrest to be made, then, then leave it alone. You know, instead of trying to force something that's what really not. Judge Brown? Okay. Um, well, I also went down and read uh, part of the OPA report and I watched all of the video and first thing that struck me was that the officer did not advise the mother initially that he was recording it which he should have done uh, he directed the mother to go get the the daughter and she was brought back and he didn't advise the daughter that they were being recorded and frankly having ordered the daughter to be brought back uh, in my view and I've had some experience with criminal work over the last 40 years uh, he should have given a Miranda warning which he did not um, not of great consequence because they didn't end up prosecuting the citation that he issued was for leaving the scene of the uh, accident uh, I could justify calling the tow truck the it was on Granny White Pike and it was right in a bend and there was some problem that while it wasn't actually on blocking a street, it was right on a point where it was dangerous. And, you know, uh, I could understand calling a, a, the private, uh, or calling the Metro truck because it, it did pose a, a risk. Uh, but the officer's decision to not issue a warning uh, to me was, uh, as mentioned, a lack of uh, requesting advice, calling a, a, a for, former colleague and uh, another police department uh, uh, doesn't cut it. And the statute, I've looked at the statute, uh, and it does not prevent uh, issuing a warning. Uh, and in my view, 
the officer's failure to just use this as a warning uh, was, was an abuse of, of his authority. Uh, and clearly his report uh, as director has pointed out uh, that he made his interview to OPA was uh, just was inaccurate. Uh, he made several false statements in it. Uh, the, the mother was was upset over her daughter being arrested, but she wasn't acting out and she wasn't uh, wasn't doing anything except being very upset over the fact that uh, when he announced that she was going to arrest the, the daughter and, and clearly the daughter was very upset in the back of the patrol car. Uh, one concern I've got is that this case, again, is pointing out the problem that we have in delays in these cases. We we had five months from the time the draft was prepare, prepared by the staff to approval, and we had an investigation ran from August of, August of 21 to March of 22. And so we're, you know, we're going back to things that occurred June of 21. And we've got to do something to speed these things up. Um, and, but so my concern about is having it rewritten, go back to the staff for rewriting, is I wish there would be some way we could propose a, um, an amendment to the report so we could vote on it and uh, have it done. But frankly, I would like to see uh, consideration of Chief, Dr Chief Drake. Uh, uh, one is issuing an apology to the mother and the daughter, and second, that the department take a hard look at why they say you cannot issue a citation for a traffic offense involving a juvenile. It makes no sense to me at all. Uh, so that's my two cents worth. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Board Member Brown. Uh, Member Holloway. Um, you were saying the car was towed by a metro tow vehicle. Well, you know, at the same time, um, the parents could have been allowed the opportunity to get the vehicle moved if they felt like it was in a dangerous situation. You know, they may know someone they feel comfortable in, in touring the board where it may have been less expensive on them. And also, um, you know, Writing that citation, it was in a situation where he could have gave her a juvenile citation instead of a misdemeanor arrest citation. Well, it doesn't look like the Metro's policy permits that. <clears throat> uh, I saw Ms. Goddard. I'm sorry, I can clarify that. I'm sorry. No, please do, please do. I can clarify the point about juvenile citations. Okay. Juvenile yes, so the, 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 policy, the policy that's implicated is an MNPD policy. It's at 16.10.040, and that does say that no juvenile citation shall be um, issued if the, offense is, if the offense is a traffic offense. So it is a very broad um, policy, and that, that, that does pertain specifically to juvenile yeah. citations. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I'll just chime in. The extrapolation of that is that basically, you know, they're really trying to protect the Jews, less known. Uh, they're telling you you can't issue a citation. So the inversion of that is going to arrest is just kind of out of the question. <laughs> you know, it's, it's there to protect the juvenile. I'm certain that it doesn't mean don't issue a citation. Go ahead and arrest them. I, th I think it... I don't want to interpret it too much, but I think it, it, based on the other offenses that are in that category, I think it, I think it does uh, skew towards an arrest. Uh, the other offenses in there involve, um, you know, the public intoxication, the reasonable likelihood that the offense would continue, um, you know, someone's safety being jeopardized. So, so the other categories in there of offenses do sort of all um, skew towards a custodial arrest. I, I don't know why traffic is in there, but understood. And then on the other issue of the tow, uh, that portion of NPD manual 6.20.040, circumstances under which you can uh, call for a vehicle tow, it clearly says that the uh, 
the, the citizen should uh, be able to first contact the tow truck driver to have their car removed prior to it being uh, towed by MMPD, and that was an issue. I had one more thing, I see, uh, yes, sir, mm -hmm. and that was, uh, was that just hearsay, the statement uh, attributed to the officer, or she's going to act a fool, or was that evidenced by something that was reviewable? No, that's just the officer's impression. Um, because he had made a determination that he was going to arrest her daughter. Right. But did he say that? Yes. And how yes. do you corroborate he that, that he said that? It's, so on he, the it's recorded on the okay. body okay. worn camera. Okay, that was my question. Okay, I yeah. got you. Okay, so it's on the body worn cam or That's the correct. dash cam. Okay, I got you. All right, thank you for that. All right, board member Holloway. Um, this is going to be my last statement. We can close on it. It depends on who you are. It, um, everybody don't get a chance to get the opportunity to go home. Some people get a chance to go to, go down, go to jail. And uh, if you look like me, guess what? Chances are you're going to get arrested, you know. And uh, if you're a clean-cut citizen, you may have a better chance of not getting arrested. And um, some some people use discretion on personal appearance or their attitude where they make a decision on how they're going to enforce the law on was on a misdemeanor situation you know but some people get uh get the luxury of getting taken home uh allow you get their parents to take care of them i understand i recognize uh board member win i had a, a couple of questions the the charge how was it adjudicated at juvenile court if you can tell us that um and second I'm curious, what I'm hearing, what I read in the report is it sounds like you're saying the officer is untruthful. Then, but it's not stated in the report. Are you, was there, was an officer untruthful in his reporting at the scene, backed up by the statements made from the actual body worn camera footage? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that, that was my read in, in the documentation. It did talk about misstatements and and unfounded statements okay. that were made. And then a, a follow-up to that, if that's true, OPA looked at the same evidence that you all looked at. Mm -hmm. Did they come to the conclusion the officer was lying? You want to answer that? OPA sustained at least one, uh, there, yeah. but, were, they, but there were no sanctions. Uh, uh, that, OPA, that su OPA sustained a deficient performance. They did not um, sustain any kind of an uh, false statement or anything like that but but there were statements that his statements in opa did find statements in his report were incorrect yes and that was also multiple statements multiple yep. statements and that was agreed with by other officers who were interviewed as part of the opa process right. as well that, that's what i was no I, that i think judge brown wants to comment go ahead thank you judge brown The complainant and her daughter were of Asian descent. I'm sorry? The complainant and her daughter were of Asian descent. Great. All right. Uh, anything further on this issue? Uh, I see. <laughs> I see member guy. Well, we've, we've talked about a lot of stuff and we're pretty far from a resolution. So <laughs> making a resolution, either way you don't use the term resolution, noun or. Um, I, what I would be comfortable with, and this is not a resolution yet, is having adding a line to the report, making reference to, I'm sorry, to the PRR, making reference to the investigation report or audit, whatever this one's called, for additional information. So if somebody reads this and, and has questions about why we're a strong sanction, there's, there's a, an arrow there for them to ask for a copy of that report if they want. Um, then adopting the report with the, the findings uh, the executive director has presented and I don't think it goes in the report but I would sure like to see and maybe a second resolution whatever that uh, the chief we have a conversation with the chief and I, I'm not sure if that's just the executive director or how that works on the broader problem we see here of it basically being exculpatory the way OPA is interpreting it for an officer not to understand the law 
know that he doesn't understand the law, not call his superior, and in this case, arrest a juvenile, handcuff her, put her in the back of a car with her mother, understandably hysterical, and drive her downtown. There's just some piece of that we are worlds apart on in trying to, to understand where he's coming from or if he agrees with this. Yeah, that, that, that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to come back and see if we can capsulize that in the form of something that we can all vote on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Reverend Turner. Question: Is there still, okay, you know, when I was working for juvenile, there there was a juvenile division of the police department, and you would think that they would to get some clarity mm -hmm. on whether or not we should, what I should do, or what you should do, um, to call the juvenile division of the police department to get some clarity on what to do. Um, second, was there, from my understanding, there was a backup call, if I'm not mistaken, was this backup call? And it just seems like there's some type of, in my opinion, some type of motive. Again, this is like a pattern uh, of, of motive um, to arrest this um, young juvenile, young lady. It's a juvenile. And uh, I don't know, it just, it just, it's, it's, it's funny to me that you would do this for backup for a juvenile, non-threatening situation is a traffic violation um, and not do the same for other incidents that are highly escalated um, potentially violent, where you would need to call back up to um, try to de-escalate. I'm just saying, it, it just seems that, um, it just seems backwards to me, uh, that for something very minor, you would do this and act in this, this type of motive. But then when there, there's a serious situation where you really need backup for de-escalation that you don't even do that. Um, so, you know, this is my little statement, but I, I just, uh, it just seemed like the officer just had a motive just to arrest, you know, as soon as they got, for whatever reason, uh, to, to arrest um, this juvenile. And again, didn't have anything to really back up uh, to, to do that, so. I see Director, I'm sorry, Board Member Spencer. Thank you. Um, I think from all the comments that we made so far, where my mind keeps heading, and I believe it's mentioned that the officer has left, correct? I keep coming back to that. And I think I would like to perhaps add into a motion to add an official tally of this officer um, and the total amounts of cases that we've had of officers that have done something that's been sustained and have left the force. Because I think that we need to have that as just a number that the public is aware of. Uh, just as a rotating number. Um, I think that, I mean, because I think we're generally in consensus around the magnitude of what's happened here. And at the same time, someone has just up and left. And, you know, I think and re with regards to the investigative timeline, you know, I, there are also, as we've brought up before, sort of systemic issues as to why the timeline is, is the way it is, even though it can be improved upon, but parts, parts of why it can be that way. But I think for every time that, you know, we're having conversations with other members of the public, what have you, that we need to also be able to look to that number um, because that says that, for someone that did some harm in our community, they've just gone on and they have perhaps the opportunity to do the same somewhere else. And I think that that is something that we must never shy away from. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, I, I, I understand. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to uh, separate uh, what may be policy research issues, okay, uh, from this PRR, that is, this recommendation that is in front of us. Uh, I think that staff, our investigators, our legal resource team, and uh, our AD and, and ED 
have uh, been thorough in their investigation and have brought to us what they could in, in terms of disclosure of information. I uh, certainly don't want to cross over any lines into that. Uh, and uh, we could look at adopting this recommendation as presented and then getting an instruction uh, to, to staff to bring back numbers for us related to uh, officers who have resigned presumptively or optically. We don't know why, really. It's, it's, it's a difficult thing to really, you know, correlate. Essentially you know, preemptively. While under investigation. I mean, it can only be make assumptions from that. You follow me? Okay, because people leave for their own different personal reasons. And then to maybe get a little further information about this policy of citation or arrest. Citation or arrest. And, and maybe it's a training issue when it comes to, I, I'm not sure if I had the opportunity to issue a warning. I mean, I, I'm, I'm being generous here, okay? Uh, but I heard Member Goddard speak earlier to what may be some confusion with an officer understanding what, when it comes to a juvenile, their options were? I, my concern is broader than that. If an officer has confusion about whether a crime has been committed and what his range of discretion is, if one has been committed, but how to respond to that, there doesn't seem to be any clear procedure of how he's supposed to resolve those questions, be it juveniles, be it other people, be it whatever. And, and I would, would like to have a discussion that broad on that subject. Uh, and, and this could go down, this, this could be a, a large and it broad discussion. Be, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Holloway talked about it. And, but but mm, mm, the, um, I, I, I'll just leave, I'm not going to talk any, any further. Exactly. Well, well, I'm okay. just going to say, like, there is an expectation that when a person is a field training officer, as this officer was, that that person should have a certain amount of knowledge of the law, as well as if they're training new recruits and whoever else. Um, I'm, my concern here is if he is at the time was looking, you know, at five, talking to five different people to get something, you know, to kind of uh, figure out what was going on with this particular citation or this particular policy. Uh, my concern is how did he ever become a field training officer? And the people, I don't know how many years he was a field training officer, um, but my concern is how that, you know, and I've always said this about field training officers, like what kind of vetting, what kind of process do they go through to become field training training officers, and especially when we have one calling around, you know, five different people to determine one singular issue that I think it was clear from five people saying that maybe you should think, rethink this. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm learning. I'm not a police officer. I don't know the 1,400 plus page manual. Uh, God bless them. Uh, but, but is it proper? Well, Re rewind, rewind. Isn't that prescription that you go to your supervisor? Is, isn't that the, what, what it says you should do? I, I'm asking a question. I, I don't know if the policy allows for you to go to an outside third party and request guidance on a arrest situation. I'm sure, I'm probably sure it doesn't say that. I think that. the policy's silent. Is it silent? That, I guess this is what we're getting to. Is it silent? It's silent as to on the issue of when it comes to you're in the field, you're looking for some information about your the incident and, and, and you need to take it. I don't want to say you want to take it up line. You know, you go to your supervisor, right, for advice or, or can you go to other officers can you go to the outside third party? What what does it say the, without making a, a, a statement about policy that I can't back up? I will say that in, in the course of the OPA investigation, other superior officers are all in agreement that that was improper. So I would just kind of defer. I, I am because I, I don't, you know, I don't want to, you know, have state some expertise I don't have uh, in that area. But I, it, the agreement among the other officers interviewed was that going outside, that the question should have been presented to the officer's right. sergeant and was not, and that his going to officers outside of MNPD was was categorically inappropriate. As well as there was documentation within that report that was just not factual. Yeah, right. 
All right. And, and I would not call Commander Laura, you know, to talk about this because that would be a very unfair question. I know he's in the room probably wanting to say something, but it's probably in everyone's best interest that we just continue with our discussion. I, I saw I saw a hallway in the board member win, and we're going to try and make some sense about this. Okay. He has a, what you call a change of command. Um, he got a sergeant, he got a lieutenant, and he got a captain. So this is the the change he should have gone through. As the sergeant didn't know, go to the lieutenant. But him being a field training officer, he should have known, and not that uh, he's perfect. Uh, a lot of training, we got good training at the police academy, don't get me wrong. But a lot of times people lose some of their training in the field. You know, you get this part of town, you train one way, and in another part of town, you train another way. But the, the policy and the law are the same, and he should have went to his sergeant, and the sergeant could have gone to the lieutenant if he didn't know. Uh, board member Wynn. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. I supervised FTOs for several years, um, patrol FTOs, as a patrol sergeant. And the sergeant's responsible not only for what you call a span of control, which is the people who immediately work for you, which could include FTOs for his sergeant. Part of that responsibility is to evaluate the performance of the FTO. Uh, at one time, and it may have changed, when we went through accreditation, we were doing quarterly profiles on every employee that worked for us, which gave you the opportunity to make notation if they didn't understand procedure, the criminal code, any of it, which would be that sergeant's responsibility to make sure that FDO understood it. Um, and there, you know, there's a possibility that the sergeant wasn't available. They were busy with some other officer. They, they were on some other duty, and, and he was looking for an answer, and he couldn't find it. That's a possibility. But when you say policy around this kind of thing, that's probably not the accurate thing to say. We're talking about just basic procedure of policing, just the day-to-day -day procedure how a paramilitary organization works. Uh, you can't put everything in a policy. That's not possible, which means you have to hire people that have the competence to do the work so you don't have to watch them every minute. Um, so some of this is not in policy. You know it because that's the way you're trained in the academy and that's the way the day-to-day -day function of the police department operates. But for this officer, um, as an FTO, his sergeant would, would have been responsible, and I'm sure there's a record at the police department of the officers or the sergeant's performance evaluations of the FTO. Um, the, and I'll, one last thing I'll say about this, I kind of go back to the original, um, my original question, and that is untruthfulness. That's, if you can't trust a police officer on a decision like this, you can't trust them on anything else. Um, if they're liars, they're liars. We don't need liars in policing. Um, that's not what policing is about. This is a noble profession. We don't need liars in policing. So if that's what happened, uh, I might understand why he left Metro Police and went somewhere else. Um, but um, the checks and balances are there. If, there were, if they work correctly, they're there. And the sergeant uh, had the um, responsibility to evaluate it and, and uh, make sure that the FDO was performing the way they were supposed to. So that's, when we say policy, I want to make sure to understand you cannot policy every function of a police agency. It's not possible. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I, I see uh, Board Member Goddard. I was going to speak to the, the I think, false statements, the, the, the lying, the, the part portion of it, because I think that's come up a couple of times. I'm just one reviewer, but what it appeared to me watching it, because we certainly look for policy violations, even ones that OPA doesn't allege, even ones that the clans don't allege. If we think there might be evidence, and the preponderance of the evidence standard is what we go by, um, we do look at that. We looked at discrimination. We looked at some of these other things that we didn't put into our final report because of we deal with the case that we have. Um, it felt as though we did not want to see a police officer kind of just make guesses at um, statutes. He called. He called multiple times, and he called multiple officers. What I 
subjectively interpreted from what I was seeing was here's an officer with a confidence issue, but also as he retold this story multiple times to the same people, to other people, he kept getting facts wrong and then misstating the wrong facts. So this went from a situation where, you know, he had the discretion not to arrest or cite or find any violation of law, and then it con con uh, descended into this. She doesn't want a report made. She's told me I don't know how to do my job. She's told, she said he's made multiple statements that just are nowhere in the record, but in his conversation with other folks, they add more information. Oh, it's probably because she didn't have any plans to come back to the scene. It's probably because she didn't want a report being made. And so you can, I can find a, a needle, I guess, where it gets to the point where he's making a false statement in a written report without getting to the point that I think he's knowingly lying in the report, but that as he's spinning this story in his head and telling other folks, he's just getting the facts wrong or he's motivated to get the facts wrong and is telling a, a mis an untrue statement. But that's not something that we found by a preponderance of the evidence. All right, I saw, I, I, I saw board member Haddock, I saw Director Fitcher, and I know that Mr. Goddard has something as well. Uh, I'll, I'll, let me defer here quickly to uh, Director Fitcher, please. competence in the performance of his duties after he responded to an accident and made a warrantless arrest of a juvenile um, and that the case preparation unit also opined that the arrest was most likely inappropriate and so that he didn't continue to ask the right questions and so I'm saying all that to say that the OPA did not discipline him right, right. and so yeah. I just wanted to put that out there so that as we move on through this like whether he whether he didn't tell the facts he didn't tell truthful statements at the end of the day all of that was presented they put it in their report they documented all of that and then they still they sustained it but they still did not give this officer any discipline for it so that's the bottom line in my opinion here all right, we'll, we'll go with uh, Board Member Haddock and then let's uh, go to uh, Board Member Goddard and see if we can uh, somehow or another get to a recommendation here. So I understand, uh, Attorney Yoon, is, is what you're saying regarding um, uh, using really our discretion on how you uh, determine uh, the offenses, if you will, but items 12 through 14 clearly state that he, um, I know we use the language, he, his story changed or, you know, he kind of made these things up as he was talking to different people, but he stated things that just wasn't true, right? So then that means that they're false. So how do we indicate this in the PRR just to make sure that people really understand that um, if you're saying things even to other officers or the people that you're calling on the phone and they're not true, um, it's saying it in items 12 through 14, but how do we explicitly say that in this report for, for a matter of record? I think the breakdown becomes there are things that we investigate that have the the title of false statement. And when you boil down into the definition of it, you have to have a mens rea slash intent or knowing as opposed to how do you know someone's not doing a bad job and just bad at conveying accurate information versus how do you know that they're just knowingly telling a falsehood that they know is untrue, that they know the truth and they're just willfully saying something different. I, I think that's where Oh, I can't speak for OPA, but that's where I, at least, was looking at the policy on making a false statement. It's talking about when you're under oath. He wasn't under oath when he wrote this report. Obviously, he has some duty and responsibility as part of his job to write accurate statements. But when we talk about making a false statement in common parlance, when we're just talking about it, I mean, that means when you're lying verbally, when you're writing something down that's untrue, but when you're writing it down in a report, it's not considered a false statement under MMPD policy. Making a false statement is when you've sworn to a judge or you've sworn under oath to our uh, investigator or to the, you know, or in, in the, that sense is when they're using false statements as a policy matter. So that's why we didn't sustain a finding or make a really uh, uh, 
a look towards, I think, false statements. Yeah. But does it make sense to uh, give reference to adherence to policy and rules and uh, something that we did make a finding on, and it does speak to ethical yeah. violations? So it, it, in a way, we addressed it based upon as best we could, because there is a recommendation for discipline uh, coming from our board. Uh, in that area. All right, let's uh, let's go to uh, uh, got a resolution. member got, uh, got it. Yes. A proposed resolution to try to get there. I would, given this guy's gone and nothing's going to happen to him, I would uh, suggest, I'll, I'll make a motion that we accept the report and recommendations as presented by the executive director, but add a sentence that says a more complete description of the facts and circumstances that lead to uh, sanctions of this severity is contained in whatever the document's called, our investigative report. That if somebody reads it, they don't know how, why this guy got this. That's the end of the, rest of the motion. Didn't know why he got this much. There's a straight road map to the more complete document that gets into a lot of that. I I, I, well, okay, there, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? A second. Okay, it's been moved and properly seconded that we add a, 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 a line uh, to the report referencing the investigative report for further information about how we got to our recommendation. Let me ask again uh, our legal resource advisor, what does that do for us timeline wise? If anything, does that push us back at all? No, sir. We I won't have to see this. Done before, yeah. And we'll do it without having to come to back to the board with it. Yeah, the we motion was to accept the report and, and the recommendation. Gotcha. Just make that one modification. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Okay, great. All right, you've heard the motion, you've heard the second. Any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. I want to thank staff and this board for tremendous uh, thoughtfulness on this, on this very important PRR. Uh, it brings out a lot of issues here. Uh, we are going to defer our second PRR at this time. I am understanding <laughs> that there are uh, a couple of members of the public who would like to come before this board who were not here at first call. So if you would, uh, if you are here to speak before this board, please come to the front, uh, have yourself a seat, state your name, and uh, you'll have... Um, oh, uh, wherever, uh, okay. wherever, you, wherever you're comfortable. Uh, um, I'm not familiar with the limitations okay. of the public. Up, okay, turn on the red light. Please state your name, and uh, we'll we'll give you an initial three minutes. Okay, um, I'm T, and I am here on behalf of tenants at Hobson Flats in Antioch, mm -hmm. Tennessee. I'm sure you're very familiar. Um, actually, the board member here, Mark, you mentioned the word paramilitary, and um, like the definition of the word paramilitary means like kind of like military, but not close. I want to keep on that when I'm talking. Um, so we're going to go back to 2020. Okay. Governor Bill Lee, he announced recommendations uh, to improve the training that cadets get. It's about 300K in funding from the CARES Act. Um, and it was supposed to establish an advisory council that continues to work to ensure that law enforcement receives the best training and standards to respond to the evolving needs of officers. And this included things like community interaction and community Im immersion. Um, they also, in, in 2021, uh, Metro Nashville Police Department also launched the Office of Alternative Policing Solutions. And the agency is supposed to partner with nonprofit groups and community stakeholders to kind of curb violent crime and um, engage with disenfranchised groups and, you know, all that feel good stuff that we were told in 2020 was going to fix the problem. Um, even uh, the chief of police, Drake, he says, like, why can't we become policemen and do things right? I want to be the police officer that, you know, causes change. I believe in change. I embrace change. The change is coming. That was May 2021. So where's the change? When we were organizing with tenants when no other organization, these nonprofits, these stakeholders that y'all say are in the community, no one was here with these tenants, um, organizing with them, talking to them at all. And it took us months to get this footage. But now there is footage. Everyone on this board, I'm sure, has seen it. There was multiple detonation devices used against residents who are disabled people, who are children with epilepsy, who are black and brown family members. And it is completely beyond me that there is not an immediate and, and swift backlash to this. Um, and I think that there are a few things that need to be pointed out. Um, it seems that the community liaison police officers are only available when press is there. 
I don't know if they're in like the PR department. I don't know if all the black and brown police officers are only working for the PR department because it really seems like people can scrounge them up when there's a camera. But when we look at these raids, all I see are white officers. No one there spoke Spanish when there were a, a significant number of Hispanic residents who had no idea what was going on. Um, and I would like to point that the war on drugs is actually an ongoing quasi-military operation that never ended um, because you said that it's a paramilitary organization. But I would argue that there were clearly probably military organizations directly involved in this raid um, because the National Guard has a joint task force with the police department for counter drug operations and they did this entire operation over 30 grams of crack in a gun, which is not specified that the gun was used in the commission of a crime. So I'm not really understanding whether or not the gun was even illegal in the first place or if the resident was exercising their second amendment or right that is given to them by the constitution of this nation. But I would like to ask, um, you know, what, what task force was involved in this, this raid? It wasn't just Metro Nashville Police Department. And if it's not Metro Nashville Police Department, then we need to have a conversation with the Department of Defense and really get to why their counter drug efforts are wasting taxpayer money on a municipal, state, and federal level for 30 grams of crack. When I'm watching these frat boys at Vanderbilt push more weight through their townhouses. I mean, really, can anyone justify 40 plus police officers in full military gear, the type of stuff that you see 13 year olds playing with on the new Call of Duty? How does that justify it? And I asked this to the public and I asked this to all the police representatives, you know, like you talk about the bureaucracy of it all and you can't, you can't policy it away. You're right, because they're not accountable to us. And they're not even accountable to you. And they're not accountable to this board, especially if they're, para, they're not paramilitary, they are military officers being, you know, used as plain coast cops, undercover cops, drug task force officers, like, you know, this is a huge issue. And the fact that there's no, e even the government, like the org or the branch of the government that does accountability and puts recommendations out, it lit they literally have an article asking for more oversight of joint task force, specifically in counter drug operations. So this needs to be dealt with and it needs to be dealt with swiftly. And I know there's subpoena powder here, power here, so whatever we need to do to go to the DA's office and get that investigation started, the community wants to know who was involved in this raid. It was not just MMPD. And why were military professionals used to find 30 grams of crack, a handgun, and no resident? I rest my time. Ms. T, you. can you please let the board know? Oh, I'm sorry. We, we thank you for your time and uh, appreciate your words. Thank you very much. I was just um, going to, I know that everyone on the board may not know what she's speaking of. Um, and so I was, I can either well, do that or well, allow, allow her to Well, public comment is not subject to debate, nor is it subject to a vote. So we appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, is, is there someone else from the public who wishes to address this board? Please come forward. Please come forward. Uh, it's an email. Oh, okay. Director Pitcher. Okay. All right. Uh, this is submitted um, today at 3.17 p.m. by Melissa Cherry, a community member. Uh, good afternoon. I'm a resident of District 3 in Nashville, and I am writing today to send my support to the members of our Nashville Community Oversight Board and civilian oversight across the state. Your work here is the embodiment of the will of the people. In 2018, the mothers of two murdered sons led over 100,000 Nashville residents to demand empowered, funded, and independent civilian oversight for MMPD. Our institutions and their liberal cheerleaders thought there was no chance, but the parole, I'm sorry, but the people of Nashville showed up not only to vote, but they petitioned and campaigned for months by the existence of the board. Today, the Tennessee legislator seeks to undermine all of their work, all of your work, and the confidence of the people of Tennessee that their leaders respect their will. Bills SB 0591 and HB 0764 must be opposed by all people of conscience to support a, cultural, a culture of healing during these trying times. 
Civilian Review and Oversight Boards play an essential role in making sure that the criminal justice system, including law enforcement, appropriately respond to the victims of brutality and sexual assault. It also provides both uniform and civilian women another pathway to address mistreatment without fear of retaliation. We worry about our sisters on the force as well as those in our diverse neighborhoods. The passage of this bill would significantly worsen police community tensions in that it, number one, prevents oversight civilian review board investigations of use of force incidents prior to July 2023, including an investigation of the officers who killed Tyree Nichols. Number two, it endangers the employment status of current oversight review board staff. Number three, it gives mayors too much power in handpicking candidates to oversight review board members without input from voters, impacted constituents, and civil rights groups. Number four, it also mocks the importance of police accountability to the general public. I'm writing to urge everyone watching to reach their legislators today and ask them to oppose this dangerous legislation and protect Nashville's community oversight board staff and members. Text PLJKRW to 50409 to follow or oversight now on social media. Thank you all for your service, Ms. Cherry. Uh, yeah, Director Fitcher, can you restate the name of the uh, citizen, please, for the record? I'm Melissa Cherry. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak uh, on public comment? Uh, hearing none. Uh, we will return to uh, the second proposed resolution report uh, that is before this board, uh, Director Fitcher. Yes. Carry us through that. Okay. <laughs> I know you multiple hats on right there. Okay. So the next PRR is uh, D-2021-014, and this is um, an allegation of misconduct is um, against supervisors of the detective um, Jesse Holt. Um, it, number one, the adherence to rules, and number two, deficient performance of duties. The summary of the complaint is, at the PRR presentation to the COB, members voted to continue the investigation of MNCO CC 2020-035 in order to determine if the subject officer, uh, Detective uh, Jesse Holt's supervisors viola violated any MMPD policies during their review of the death investigation um, of the complainant's son. Specifically, the question was raised if they failed to super and supervise the investigation being conducted by the detective. So on October 27th of 2021, the board voted to initiate a new director initiated complaint against the supervisors of this detective and whether they failed to properly supervise and oversee the investigation. Um, at the hearing, the board found that the detective failed to adhere to the rules by way of not testing evidence and not obtaining a search warrant for the phone and also was deficient in the performance of his duties, specifically by not investigating further into the cause of the death, um, which was um, in the uh, first alleged complaint. Um, during his interview um, and in his conversation with the complainant, um, he made statements that they don't investigate these cases <coughs> as murders as a police department and that the DA or the district attorney's office doesn't recognize them as murder cases or prosecute overdose cases. Um, the question was raised by the board as to whether his supervisors were aware of and had approved his decisions. Um, in other words, were the actions of the detective a result of a failure of their supervisors to oversee his actions? Um, in Chief Drake's response dated March the 3rd of 2022, the chief rejected the findings of the board and wrote, prior to 2021, the origin of drugs and overdose cases were not generally investigated by MMPD, except for exceptional cases. And when there were exceptions, the investigations were conducted by the Specialized Investigation Division and not the case detective. At that time, case detectives were working within each um, particular uh, precinct. 
um, is on July 6, 2022, uh, the MNCO interviewed the detective supervisor, um, Sergeant Hinkle, who stated that the East Precinct was in a transitional phase, at which time there was no written policy, um, but other units like the Crime Suppression Unit and the Special Investigations were consulted to further work on whether to investigate beyond whether it was an overdose or whether it was an, a homicide. Um, when asked whether detectives were told by MMP leadership that the DA's office would not prosecute over those cases, the sergeant said it seems like there was a question as to whether or not they would as to what they would need to prosecute. Uh, I can't say with absolute certainty that I've ever heard um, anyone say that the DA's office will not prosecute um, overdose cases. Um, this, the sergeant went on to state that after reviewing the reports from the incident based on how investigations were working in 2020, he felt that the detective did everything he was supposed to do um, and what might be expected of him at the time. Um, and so our investigator on May 11th of 2022 spoke with the lieutenant at that precinct. And according to that lieutenant, um, the detective and the precinct detectives were not doing death investigations nor overdose investigations in 2020. When asked about MMPD policy, the lieutenant said, as a whole, the department didn't work overdose investigations as a rule unless it was related to something bigger. And he further stated that he had not seen any directive saying that the DA's office would not prosecute those overdose those cases. Um, and, but in this case, the medical examiner's findings was that it was accidental and that fentanyl was a new thing coming to Nashville two years ago. Now it's a massive thing and it's gotten attention over the last couple of years. Um, and so the discussion here is that the MMPD did not have a detailed written policy as it relates to investigations of death as, a, as, a, uh, as it related to drug overdoses at that time. Um, there does appear to have been a general pattern practice and unwritten policy of precinct detectives not investigating those types of cases of those deaths that the result of drug overdoses beyond receipt of the medical examiner's report. Um, all of this appears to point toward a department that was slow to transition to fentanyl related death investigations and have since updated its policies and created a new unit to investigate death investigations as a result of the drug overdose. Um, and now there's also um, a neighborhood safety unit operating as part of the special investigation divisions of the narcotics section, as well as the TBI has a joint task force that they are um, looking at fentanyl related deaths as, as well. Um, in the chief's response and during the interview uh, of the detective supervisor, they affirmed that his actions were in accordance with policy at the time and that the department acted consistently with the then existing practice of not investigating further. Um, as noted in the investigative report, the wisdom of these past practices or the sufficiency of the updates to those practices currently in place appears to be a policy question best left for further consideration by this board. And so in conclusion, after reviewing all of this evidence, the, I conclude that the allegations of misconduct against the chain of command are exonerated by policy. And that concludes this. Thank, thank this you, Director Fitcher. Report. Board member comment? I have one comment. Uh, if we could, uh, page uh, four or five, second from the last paragraph, if we could change the language, all this appears to point towards a department that was slow to transition to all of this appears to point towards a department that was transitioning its fentanyl related death investigation methods. I think uh, uh, unless there's some empirical evidence that uh, this department was behind the timeline of, uh, of, 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 of most other departments. Uh, I think using that adjective slow may, may not uh, be a fair adjective to use. So I would, I would recommend that, that one change and have uh, no other uh, issues with the report. So I, 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 I rarely, I don't like making a motion from the, from the chair, but if there's any further discussion. Board member Goddard. I'll move that we accept the report and uh, recommendations as presented by the executive director with the one change just requested by the chair. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Thank you, Director Fitcher. All right, uh, that takes us to uh, 
the uh, MOU negotiations update, uh, subcommittee chair, uh, uh, board member Goddard. Uh, thank you. Yes, we had, um, a, we had a, another negotiating session with the uh, police department led by uh, Assistant Chief Hager. That, in my opinion, went very well. We are down. We've agreed on all matters except two. Uh, and agree means we will present to you our, our unqualified recommendation at the end of the discussion. We can adopt it without the board approval. One is the time involved for the CO, that the uh, COB and the police department have to hold off on taking action against an officer to give us time to investigate a matter and not have things like we just did in the first PR tonight. After a good bit of back and forth, we have uh, attentively agreed that we would get 180 days to do that, six months, and that we would have, what we have asked, they're, they're considering it, and that we would ask uh, have the ability to ask the chief for an extension beyond that uh, if we provide reasons and that extension will be deemed granted unless the police chief responds with the denial giving his reasons. So that's where we'd be with that. And, and then we'd be on staff and the primary executive director prioritize which ones we've got so we don't have hopefully none but not too many falling in that where the COB takes action that precludes ours having effect. The second uh, dealt with um, information with respect to uh, police officers changing jurisdictions on the inbound they agreed that they would require anyone who has been an officer elsewhere seeking to be an officer in Metro waive any confidentiality rights whatever else so their full um, file uh, enforcement actions things of that nature from any prior employment can be seen by Metro they'd have any problem with that on the outbound uh, an officer leaving Metro and trying to take a job somewhere else. We had concerns about investigations by the COB being of record uh, should another jurisdiction ask about that officer and any um, investigations that were underway by Metro by the COB but were not concluded. The conclusion was preempted by the officer leaving me included. They do not have a problem with that concept. They wanted to do it in a manner that would not require uh, significant additional manpower to just check something on the public records request that that goes in now uh, and wanted us to, to let them know if there's anything else. I, it burdens on me to, and I'm working on to come up with some language that would be more um, uh, address our, our concern better than that. That if someone asks about an officer whether they ask or not, they get this kind of information. Sorry, that's a lot of words, but that's the concept. Quite, quite point. all right. We, we appreciate your leadership uh, in this area. I know that you've put a lot of hours into this in collaboration with the rest of the MOU task force, and I applaud each and every one of you and thank each and every one of you for your effort and your time. And I know you'll keep us updated and in the loop as things go forward. Is there another meeting scheduled? Uh, uh, there is not. Okay. Um, but we will schedule one as soon as, as we've gotten through that language. Uh, thank I, you. I anticipate that we will ask for one in the next week or so. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Committee Chair. All right. That takes us to the legislative update uh, on calendar. Just uh, wanted to let the public be assured, as I said in my opening statement, that this board and its constituents will continue to fight to protect uh, the charter amendment that the two-thirds majority of our voters approved in 2018 uh, and we will continue to keep all parties informed uh, as to our progress um, and continue to implore each and every one of you regardless to what zip code you live in and who your representative is to uh, contact your legislators and let them know uh, that you stand with us here for transparency and accountability uh, in collaboration with our police department uh, to make sure that Nashville, Davidson County has a police force as it wishes to have that is amongst the best in the nation and gains and maintains the public trust. All right. Uh, that takes us to the executive director's report. Uh, director Fitcher will give us some highlights and then we'll reserve some time for questions. Director Fitcher. Sure. Um, I wanted to just um, kind of briefly go over this. The, um, and 
highlight it. Uh, the mayor's COB liaison, uh, I did reach out to Tom Jerkovich to find out who our liaison was and also check on the appointment from the mayor's office in regards to filling um, Miss Phyllis Hildreth's um, place. Um, because of course, if you notice, we're, we only have 10 people. Um, and so what he said was that they were working on it. Um, they were interviewing people. And so, um, as I said to you, maybe, and I don't know if I said it last month, I might have said it in the exec community, executive committee meeting, was that they had selected a person for, uh, to fill Miss Hildreth's spot, but that person um, actually ended up living out of the county, and they were unaware of that. And so they had chosen um, a, a person that I thought would have done a fantastic job on here. Um, so anyway, so they are working on that. Hopefully we'll get um, some acknowledgement of who that person is for both positions um, since Mr. Um, Bunton has departed. Um, I did want to highlight that the MMPD's Community Police Academy, I used to call it the Citizens Police Academy, I guess they changed the name, um, will begin um, on March the 7th. What that means is if you haven't attended or if you need to take additional classes, then you need to go ahead and register right away. Um, and it is a long, it's, it's 12 weeks. Um, you have to attend 10 of the 12 sessions. And I have put the information inside the report. Also for the new people um, on the board, I have given you a, um, a guideline that came from um, their, uh, the, the person, um, the, the, the outreach person. So if you have any questions, let me know. Um, so that's the next spring. The next one won't be, that's the spring session. The next one won't be until fall. It's usually in September, October, November. So I would encourage you to sign up for the one that's earlier um, because in, this, in the fall, it, it can seem rather long <laughs> because it's winter time. Um, so uh, anyway, um, the COB's fiscal year 24 budget was submitted on February the 10th as required. Um, I also received notification from our budget analyst that everything went in successfully. I sent you all that information. Um, and then they have set a, um, a date with the mayor's performance management team, which is how they've been doing it over the last couple years um, since this mayor had taken uh, had has been the mayor of in the last four years. Um, and so we have met with the performance management team and the next meeting is on March the 29th of 2023. And I would encourage you all to give me information that you wanna to take to the mayor's uh, management team, as well as um, chair, you are welcome to participate in that as well. Um, and so I wanna move on to a shooting that occurred. Um, this happened on January the 29th. Um, I received a call on that day at 6.53 p.m. from Commander Lara um, regarding a fatal police shooting that occurred in the 900 block of Buchanan Street. Um, Assistant Director Dave Kiley um, and myself arrived on the scene and we were briefed about the incident by um, MMPD officials. Um, we were told that an unidentified black male had a gun and had been waving and pointing the gun at people while he stood in the middle of the road and was subsequently shot by Metro Police Officer Dylan Ramos. The male, um, the, and he was unidentified at the time. He was taken to a hospital where he died of his injuries. Um, we were able to view a small black handgun and what appeared to be a magazine on the ground near where the shooting occurred. Um, there were spent bullet casings in the area as well. Um, at some point, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations investigators began to document the scene by photographing and numbering the evidence in the area. I would say we were there for about an hour and a half or so um, before they started that process. Uh, they got there really quickly. Um, after ensuring that the TBI investigators had taken over the scene, we left the area. We headed to the headquarters, uh, MMPD's headquarters, to review the unredacted body worn and in camera video footage. Um, we did that, it probably took us a good, you know, maybe an hour or less. And then around 1041 that evening, um, I received a call from the TBI agent in charge um, who asked me to come back to the scene and do a walkthrough. Um, but I did not do that because we had observed the scene. It was very close, it was on the street. We were very close. Um, and since it occurred outside right there, we kind of knew what happened. And so we didn't um, take him up on that. Um, and we asked lots of questions while we were watching the body worn camera of Commander Lara and the other gentleman who's showing us the video. Um, we also, um, 
requested all of the records and videos related to the shooting. And then we also um, went around and obtained video from uh, third parties who recorded the incident. And so we um, have reviewed those as well. Um, from my understanding, they, I haven't, I, the last time I checked, it, the, um, the decedent has still not, uh, next of kin had still not been notified. Um, but that may have changed because it's been over, like it's been about a week and a half or so, two weeks since I checked on that. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I have on that for now. Um, there is a force review board hearing that is scheduled for March the 23rd. Um, that is a different case in that um, we've been invited to participate in. Um, there has been three investigative complaints since the last board meeting in January. I picked up two more today. Um, so those will be in to next month. They called and left messages about their complaints. Um, we received a total of, I, I believe this number is inaccurate because I didn't put all of my calls in there, um, the ones that I've received in the last few days. But um, we received a total of 38 non-complaint contact calls for service and uh, MMPD issued five dispositions related to officer misconduct since our last board meeting in January. MNCO investigators have submitted eight requests for police records. Um, as well as we have a new personnel update. We hired a research analyst one, Miss Kath, Miss Gracie Rule, um, Catherine Rule. She is working as a research analyst one. She started on Tuesday, so we're happy to have her here. Uh, R U L E. Okay. <laughs> yes. uh, so additionally, so that, that means that we have fulfilled all the hiring for our research team. So we're done with that. Very happy about that. Um, I had to repost the investigator position um, because the, the person that we had offered the position to, um, there was some issues with benefits and crossing over and all these kind of things. So anyway, um, we reposted that. It closed on February the 20th. So we're waiting this week to get those um, who might have applied for the investigative position. Once we get that higher, we would have completed the investigative pool. We would be up to five investigators. Um, and then um, we are going to start the hiring for the administrative ser service manager and hopefully get that posted early next week. Um, I wanted to tell you two things about um, Outreach. So on Saturday, this Saturday at Fisk University, there is a health and wellness expo that we are partnering with Fisk and Meharry. Um, there will be health screenings, uh, a host of many other community driven resources for the mind, body and spirit. Um, and that is February the 25th from 10 to 2 p.m. Um, and there, it's the HBCU Wellness Project. And so there's a lot of um, different activities there. So I would encourage you all to stop by. Um, and then secondly, um, our social worker, Ms. Simone Call, has partnered with the Magruder Family Resource Center to host a family informational fun day. Um, and that she has partnered with multiple agencies, some that have um, signed on um, to host this um, this particular expo um, to inform the community about services available to them, the importance of mental health and recognizing the need for trauma informed care. Um, the invitation is open for all community members and your children. There's going to be all kind of fun things to do, booths, uh, informational sessions, giveaways, food. Um, she's partnered with the neighborhood health a live hospice, mental health co-op, Queens Palace Foundation, Family and Children's Services, the Goodwill Incorporated, Metro Family Safety Center, Metro Health Department, Suicide Prevention, the JCAJ, and Greater Nashville Regional Council. JCAJ? JCAC. Oh, the Gene Crow Advocacy Center, okay. That's okay. All right, and so one other last update I think is a highlight here is um, myself, um, and Mr. Kiley as well, um, as, along with um, employees and staff and leaders of the Metro Social Services and Metro Action Commission met with Metro Property and General Service employees to tour multiple locations in the Metro Center area. Um, we looked at um, two buildings in that area, uh, two departments, MSS, which is Metro Social Services and MAC, um, they express that they have some unique needs like they need because they offer a nutrition center um, and they have some other like um, food pantries that they needed to have a loading 
dock connected to their location. So one of the buildings had that, one of them didn't. Um, my, I told them like our, we have different needs. So we, you know, um, there are two buildings there that they are trying to determine how they would work. So hopefully one of the two or, you know, or if we have to be separated, it's fine. Um, of course, I like one building over the other, but um, at the same time, I understand that they're, you know, trying to group us together purposely to um, save, um, to have funding and savings. Um, but both proposed locations are situated on an accessible transit line and have ample parking space. And once again, what I will do is amplify the fact that we need to have, we need to move, um, especially since I'm sure all of you have heard um, and saw in the news that our space at the Washington Square has some very serious concerns with listening devices in and around the building. And so because of that, um, I think it is time that we um, move quickly out of that location. So that concludes my report. All right, questions for Director Fitcher on any of the items presented? Any of the items presented? All right, hearing none, thank you very much for that thorough report. As always, appreciate that. Okay. All right, that takes us to <clears throat> that takes us to uh, the MNPD response time and clearance rates informational report. Uh, Gavin Crowell Williamson, Williamson, our lead research analyst, please take us through that. So, so it's a team of three now, is that, is that right? Gavin, Dylan, and Kathy, is that right? Okay, got gotcha you now, okay. Is that, is that, did I get Gracie that? is the third member. Gracie. Gracie, a rule, got gotcha. you. Gracie. If you wanna go with rule, you'll have to talk to her about that, I guess. Um, but uh, I'm glad to not be pushing up against the 8 p.m. hour with you all tonight. Um, I'll try to keep us uh, on track for that. Um, but this this report is consolidating some information about MMPD's response times, clearance rates, and caseloads. Um, and it comes from a request from the chair. Um, I presented in August of last year, just generally, <clears throat> excuse me, generally on response times. Um, but I have updated information on those response times as well as kind of consolidating that information with clearance rates um, and uh, caseloads for the department. Um, we're here generally because uh, we've received information from a number of different channels about uh, the fact that call response times, queue times, and officer, uh, just overall response times are unacceptably long in the eyes of many community members. And long response times really do pose two different issues. One, public safety. Um, certain crime types just demand a very quick police response. Um, but number two, also community perception. Um, it, it's been shown in research that um, folks often base their, their measure of police legitimacy, uh, community satisfaction, and the efficacy of the police on factors like response times. So these are really important things um, in, in sort of two respects there. To respond to that, MNPD has taken a number of steps. They've modified their shift schedules. They've released an app that you can report low-level crimes on. And they've actually um, applied for and received funding on a federal grant to research AI processing for uh, low priority calls. So they are trying to do a number of things, but it remains a pressing issue um, here in early 2023. Um, and now that's kind of the information that was presented back in August. And we're gonna to try to link together that information with uh, declining clearance rates across the country, as well as with MNPD's current caseloads across various investigative bureaus. So you can see on this graph here, I've highlighted Nashville in red. Um, response times are definitely a national issue. They're happening, uh, they're increasing in a number of police departments. But Nashville um, was the subject of a study by a data analyst named Jeff Asher, who looked at calls for service data for a number of departments across the country. Um, and you can see here of those departments that he looked at, Nashville from 2019 to 2022 had the second highest increase in response time and average response time behind only New Orleans, who had a truly staggering increase of 95 minutes um, over that four year span. And also of the average response times in 2022, MMPD has the third longest response time of those departments he studied behind again, New Orleans and also San Francisco this time. So breaking those numbers down a little bit further, you can break calls down by uh, 
beyond the average response time to call code one, code two, and code three calls. You can see that uh, bottom purple line on the graph there, that's response time for emergency calls. From 2020, that number was at 10.7 minutes. Today, at the end of 2022, it sits at 15. For urgent calls, that is that blue line on the graph. They've increased from 35 and a half minutes to 64.2 last year. And response time for routine calls has almost doubled from 66 minutes in 2020 to 129 um, in 2022. That's that green line at the top. This is just a reproduction of that uh, graph on the previous page with, with the numbers there, so I'll breeze by that. You can also break down calls into two major elements from a police department's perspective anyways. It's the length of time that officers are traveling, which is that blue line. I, I'm, the I'm graph. sorry. Yes, sir. CW, do you want us to ask questions as they come up per slide sure. or shall we wait to the end? I'm good with, I'm good with pausing. Is there a pleasure? Either way? Okay. Uh, let me let me ask you about the, this particular slide right here. Uh, average time in queue. That's a part of the uh, dispatch element. What what does that mean? Sure. So I think the best way to answer that is to explain also what travel time is. Basically, travel time is the time that when an officer is dispatched on that call, from that moment to when they get on the scene. Mm -hmm. Queue time is everything else beforehand. From the moment that somebody picks up a phone and calls 911 mm -hmm. until a specific officer is sent out on the scene. So that crosses into a number of different departments, right? Part of that is the Department of Emergency Communication being able to pick up that phone and get the, get the call dispatched to the correct agency, you know, fire or EMS or 911. Then part of that kind of is kicked into MNPD's court of having a dispatcher that is able to then assign a specific officer or sends a specific officer to that call. So, so, so average time in queue increased over the period by more than 50%. Yes, sir. And the director is raising her I'm hand. sorry. Yeah, so the, my question would be, in, so who controls the queue? Is that managed by the officers or is that managed you know, by uh, the dispatcher? I, w with the information I have, I, I'm not able to fully answer that. I would imagine that it's both, but I'm not 100%, so I don't want to say with, with any certainty. Okay, but we know that travel time is included in the time in queue. The average time in queue, right? No. Oh, wow, okay. Well, I'm, I'm okay. All right, thank you. Thanks for that. I thought travel time, so I thought average time in queue was from the time you picked up the phone to the time someone arrives on scene. No, it's not. <laughs> until an officer is dispatched. Oh, my. All right, okay, that, that's what I thought the report so, said. I'm, I'm sorry. No, so then those two, those two call or those two elements combine into overall so, response So I could time. be on the phone and, and I make a call and then someone doesn't get dispatched for another 57.3 minutes. On average in 2022, yes. On average. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I just come to you. Kind of free for all here. It, um, it's based on the staff that we have, and uh, compared to other cities outside, we are understaffed. You know, you got other cities that got over 2,000 police officers, and I believe uh, we just have a little over 13 off officers, 1,300 officers, and you got hundreds of people moving here each year. I mean, not each year, but each month. And so that is the major reason why the response time is, is, is not as accurate as it should be because you can't send someone out when you don't have nobody available. And so we've been talking about this time and time again, you know, that the money needs to be put in the budget to hire more officers so we can get quicker response time. Now, I understand through national research that increasing the popular, the number of officers does not necessarily decrease response time. There's been studies, I think it's noted in, in this report, and, and I, I was gonna have a question on that form as well, because I was thinking like, uh, if we look, take a look at a per capita, number, a per capita number, I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but would, would that give us significantly different results than what we're looking at here? I mean, what, what I'm telling you... No, I, yeah, I, go ahead, brother. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. What, what I'm saying to you, if we had the number of office, officers available, it would make a difference because what we don't have, uh, like uh, certain sectors you might have... 15 officers, you know, which today it may require more than that, you know, and then you can get tied up on traffic accidents, you can get tied up on uh, 
theft reports, matter of record reports, and stuff like that. So that, re that requires some more time than, than we would probably need, you know. So if you had, like I said, you got other cities uh, compared to Nashville, you got over 2,000 officers. We're still trying to police Nashville with almost the same number of people that, that we did when I left in 2013. So there's no way possible that we can make a quicker response than with the same number of officers. ask if you guys have looked at that and if you think it would make any substantial difference or you just don't know it. We have looked into it and I'm, I'm going to look to Mr. Wynn for a little guidance here. I think generally organizations like the IACP kind of tend to shy away from looking at things like that because there's so many different factors that go into police departments. You know, one just off the top of my head being city size, another being uh, kind of style of city. They're all going to impact the number of officers that are needed, um, pop population density. There's all these sorts of factors that make direct comparison of city to city really challenging. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add. No, no, you're right. I mean, urban, suburban, rural policing are different and uh, for a lot of reasons, population, but transportation time is a factor. You found that out in your report. The, the minimum staffing for patrol has always been a problem for, for Nashville, always. Um, part of the problem is the specialized assignments. Part of it is specialized units. Um, part of it is decentralized investigative services to the precincts. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for it, um, but it's it's just a constant problem. And uh, Walt is right about staffing. You 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 you've got to have officers in the car to answer the calls. And I notice in your report your staffing numbers are are they 30 percent? Is that was that they're you don't have to find it, but it's your your numbers are below the national standard. That's, uh, that's correct, yeah. yeah. Do you think that some of that is um, how the utilization of officers? I mean, I know that the police department has been really um, moving uh, in, in, in promoting a lot of officers. Um, do you think that that has an impact, a direct impact, on how patrol is staffed? Without being behind the doors to answer that question, I would suspect so. I think that uh, the, the addendum to the number Mr. Wynn brought up, roughly 36% of officers are, are, are slated as patrol officers. Mm -hmm. There's about another 12% of officers that are in supervisory roles when it comes to patrol, that being sergeants and lieutenants on, on patrol. So I don't know, I don't have an answer about what the appropriate percentage would be for staff versus supervision. But I think the department could have some discretion as to how it allocates its officers, and that's why we recommend later on in this report that MMPD consider having some sort of uh, staffing or workforce analysis. That's that's beyond the scope of what we're doing here today, but I think it's worthy of consideration. Yeah, but there 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 is that the the, the rule of sixty. Okay, and I know it's not you know totally empirical, but you know. Uh, uh, experts, I'll call them, in this field have indicated uh, that at least 60% of your officers should be assigned to patrol in order to kind of, you know, have or reduce, help reduce response time. And our percentage is somewhere in the upper 30s. Okay, maybe 36, 37 percent? 36 percent of officers, 48 so percent if you count. We're kind of a, a long way away from that rule of 60. Uh, and it's because we, well, not because, not just singularly, but part of it is, is that we have what could be interpreted in other departments, civilian functions being held by sworn personnel. We have also, and I'm not being critical, it's, it's really maybe a, a, an allocation issue. It may just be, this is the world we live in here in Nashville in our geographic area based upon how things occur here. Okay, I'm just going by the numbers in, in the report. Uh, but it, it, it is somewhat, it is somewhat uh, interesting to say the least. I saw a paddle of uh, uh, Reverend Turner. I'm trying to look at, I'm, I'm looking at the numbers in 2020 and, and before. What, we, I know we hear staffing, but were we staffed? Uh, the police department staffed in 2019, 2020. Uh, so what's, what happened after 2020 that, I mean, this is dramatic. 
um, did, I mean, is it staffing or is it something else that you can attribute this spike of the, uh, the call times after 2020? Uh, that's a bigger question than I'm prepared to answer today. Uh, I think that that's something that police departments across the country are trying to figure out. Uh, policing in a post-pandemic, in a, in a post-2020 world is just very different um, today than it was. And so part of it is officer attrition, certainly. I think that MMPD staffing levels have decreased despite the fact that our population has trended upwards or plateaued. And so that's certainly part of the explanation. But as we get deeper into the report, I think there are other factors that we can talk about as well beyond just increasing staffing numbers, though I do think that they, they have a, uh, some percentage of, of the increase in response times is due to that. Uh, well, Reverend Turner, what we saw in staffing levels that was presented to this board some time ago is that during the period there was a decrease of about 4% in terms of the number of officers. But we're looking at increase in response times, you know, uh, that, oh, of course, there's not a correlation necessarily, but I think there may be something to maybe the method or the approach or something like that. I don't know if we'll be able to solve that here, but those, that's what the numbers say. Uh, Board Member Wynn. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that one of the difficulties of management of Metro or any other police department is competing interests where um, politicians, city council members, community leaders are saying, I've got a problem here with this issue. So I need a special group of officers to deal with it. The fentanyl is a, is a good example of that with an exceptional, you know, a team to deal with it now, which I think is pretty unusual. Not many of them are in the country. But you're dealing with all these interests from all other, you know, communities saying, I want this, and you have to deal with it. The chief has to answer to the council, to the mayor. They has to appropriately put people where they are. So that doesn't solve the problem of staffing. So, you know, the old saying, no bucks, no buck Rogers is true. You gotta have the, you gotta have the seats in the patrol car to answer these calls. Um, I think Walter will, will agree. I think when I started in 79, we had 1400 officers answering 175,000 calls for service. When I left in 2001, I think 750,000 calls for service was the number. And the equivalent for the fire department was the same. Paramedics were overwhelmed as well with the same amount of paramedics for over 20 years. And what it eventually does, and this is you know, my plea to the mayor, if they, if they are, are taking our uh, are listening to this in the council, uh, is that when you overload police, and firefighters and paramedics, you're risking their lives by doing it. And you're risking the lives of the citizens by doing that as well. Uh, so it's, it's up to you to find the money to fund more uh, officers to, and paramedics and firefighters for Nashville. It's not gonna stop. Nashville's growing like crazy. Uh, it's just gonna get worse and, and, it's, and it puts everyone at risk. So I, there's a lot, this is a, one of the most complex issues and you, your report's really well done. I've written, a, I've read a thousand of these reports over the years, and we need to be careful here at the COB that the police department doesn't hire you away to work in their crime analysis division because you've done a good job on this report. It's, it's, it's reflective of real problems in policing. Other board members? Uh, okay, please continue. All right. I'm sorry, I did have another question. All right, uh, you, you differentiated between responses uh, with or without emergency equipment. Is, is that the difference between a code one and code two? What's the difference between a code one and a code two? Uh, Commander Lara, please step in if I'm, I'm saying anything inaccurately. Uh, in general, code three calls are emergency calls. Those are definitely gonna be lights and sirens. Um, code one calls are routine calls. I don't believe they have lights and sirens. Code two, does have lights and sirens. No, they do not have lights and sirens. Commander Laura? Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so code one is just a, when you can get to it, when you have a time to get to it, it's not an emergency call. Code two is a call where you wanna go directly to that call, but it's not to the level of an emergency where you need lights and sirens. 
Code three is lights and sirens. We're we're getting there ASAP. So it's three little le the three levels. One, say you know, if I have a call that's a code one call, and I see something on my way there, I can stop and 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 you know deal with whatever situation you know I I deal with on my way there. If I'm a code two call, I've got to go directly there, but it's not at a level where I'm going to have to have lights and sirens um, and and you know uh, putting others in, in in a bad situation if I'm driving fast. Code three is, this is a very, very situ uh, important and dangerous situation where we need officers there as soon as possible, and we will use the lights and sirens at that time. Well, that I thought, I, yes, absolutely. There was a significant uh, reduction in response time for calls that involved emergency equipment as opposed to those that did not. Uh, do they have different kinds of priorities? Uh, do, do they fall into one of these uh, separate categories, or is that just uh, situation dependent? But I saw there's a significantly reduced response time when emergency equipment is called out uh, uh, along with uh, public safety uh, you know, police personnel. I don't know how, uh, So what that again, means. I think it's you know, the, the severity of the call. If you're putting lights and sirens, you're getting there, and that's a priority. That's no top priority. So everything else, every other call is going to be put you know, uh, to the side to get to this because of the, the situation, the life and death situation that the officers need to get to. Um, unfortunately, many times because so many code three calls come in or calls that need immediate uh, police action, that those other calls that are code one that are not a priority at that time keep getting pushed back. Yeah. So you may have a call that, you know, has been sitting there for a report and, okay, I'm going to get to it. And then a code three call comes in. That code three call goes, you're done after an hour or two. Now I'm going to go back to that call and then another code three call comes in. So it, it's one of those where we're going to the call that needs us. Okay. That, that, that needs us most at that time, which is most serious, and those are the code three calls. So. Are all calls with emergency equipment, like ambulances and that kind of thing, considered code three? Uh, if there are lights and sirens, there are code three calls, okay. yes. All right, I'm sorry, it took me so long to get there. No. No apology necessary. Um, I think we just worked through this slide, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, if you start looking breaking calls down by call type. You can see here that uh, response times for all violent calls have increased rather significantly since 2020, though this is particularly true for uh, fights slash assault calls and shooting calls. In terms of traffic calls, they've all increased again since 2020, but most dramatically it occurs when there are calls for vehicles blocking the right of way. In terms of property calls, um, Response time for all property calls has increased, though thefts, and that's that light blue at the top of this graph here, has increased the most dramatically, nearly doubling from 2020 to 2022. If you lump together disorder and missing persons calls, they've all shown kind of similar increases in response times. And finally, if you look at non-criminal calls, um, you can see that calls in which folks just want an officer for an investigation uh, has increased the most dramatically since 2020, and all calls for mental health and substance use calls have seen pretty comparable increases and pretty significant increases since 2020. Moving on to the, the sort of novel section of this report um, in which we consider clearance rates, uh, just a quick sidebar on what a clearance rate really is. Generally, crimes are cleared when one of two conditions are met, either uh, an arrest is made or when a crime is cleared by exception. Uh, clearing a crime by exception means four things have happened. Uh, one, the subject has been identified. Two, there's enough evidence to support an arrest, make a charge and turn the subject over to the court for prosecution. Three, the exact location of the subject is known so that they could be taken into custody immediately. And then a fourth condition in which uh, the circumstances encountered in which the law enforcement agency doesn't have control over uh, that prevents them from arresting, charging, and prosecuting that person. It could be a number of things. Um, the person could pass away. Prosecution could be declined by the prosecutor. Um, extradition could be denied. There's a number of reasons. Um, but broadly, that is a crime is being cleared when it is uh, an arrest has occurred or it has been cleared by exception. So just to give some general context on what's happening here. So is it a fair interpretation on that chart that homicide clearance rates fell from 73% in 2018 to a little bit under 40% in 2021? That's a fair interpretation. Um, and we'll get into more granular stuff on the next couple of slides comparing how MMPD is faring relative to national averages, which will give more context to that. So I'll, I'll move on so that we can address that. Um, 
as you mentioned, um, on this left graph here, you can see MMPD's homicide rate in red and the national homicide clearance rate um, as, as collected from uh, NIBRS, which is an FBI database. They're following pretty similar trends. Um, they're both declining rather rapidly and they, they're sort of mirroring one another. So I think it's fair to say that MNPD's clearance rate for homicides is following national trends. Um, they're, they're, you can certainly raise concern over the national trends, but it's also important to note that oftentimes crimes are not cleared in the year that they're committed. Um, so we have 2021 data, which has been analyzed and, and uh, released in, in summer of 2022. We don't have 2023 data yet, which is why it's or 2022 data yet. That'll be released in a couple of months. But if a crime is committed, say, in December of 2021, that will often not get cleared until the next calendar year. So whenever you're looking at clearance rates, you kind of have to have that caveat in mind where the, the most recent year is naturally going to be the lowest because some number of those crimes are going to be cleared in 2022, and we just haven't been able to look at those numbers yet. So if we look you know, fast forward a year from now, if I were to represent this, the numbers in 2021 would probably be higher than they are right now. I can't say that with certainty, but just something to keep in mind as you're looking at these numbers. Uh, on the right side of this page, you can see MNPD's clearance rate for rapes, which has historically uh, always been above national averages. That, uh, that gap shrank a little bit in 2021, bringing them much closer to the national average, though they still do remain slightly above it. Then looking at both aggravated assaults and robberies, you can see the MMPD again in the red, those clearance rates are lower than national averages. Um, the, the gap decreased in 2021 for both, um, but for robberies in particular, MMPD has, has long been pretty uh, well below the national average. Whereas for aggravated assaults in 2021, MMPD brought itself pretty close to the national average. I, I, I don't suspect that, that, that it's fair to expect it answer on this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. One thing that is consistent about all of these statistics on a national level uh, is that these rates are declining. Uh, a second thing is that they began to decline uh, on uh, or during like 2019, 2020, uh, during a time where there was a lot of unwarranted uh, uh, negative attention focused on law enforcement personnel, where there were unreasonable calls uh, for actions against law enforcement personnel and that kind of thing. I, uh, it, because these national statistics all trend the same, is, the, is there something culturally going on in America as far as policing is concerned <laughs> as a result of so maybe you know, some of that unwarranted uh, negative uh, kind of, uh, of, of, of a vibe that was going on? I mean, is there, is there discussion even in, there's the, in the industry discussion. about that? There's certainly discussion. I'm not, there's also certainly not a national answer for that. There's, there's no consensus on why this is happening, but I, I, I'm sure that people smarter than I, oh my God, it's dark in here now. Um, <laughs> I'm certain that people smarter than I are trying to figure that out. Um, so I don't, I don't want to speculate on that, but uh, that, is, that is a topic under, under study. Sure. Let me say this. Uh, it's showing that some of the crime rates are going down, but whether you believe it or not, and their own security, private security, and this is a deterrence of a lot of the crime rate, and especially when you go downtown on Broadway, they got a lot of retired officers, they got other officers from other cities are working um, along the streets and the sidewalk. And so you see law enforcement all around down there, you know, not active police officers, some of them not. And so that give a person a second thought about trying to commit something in the downtown area or even in other areas. So there's a great demand of hiring extra security in a lot of events and companies and stuff. So the way that this data was presented and the way that we had to 
analyze it prevented us from making any sort of statistical comparison to see whether response times influence clearance rates or vice versa. But the point that was just made is absolutely correct. You can say in broad strokes, uh, response times are definitely increasing and clearance rates are definitely decreasing. There's probably some relationship between the two. And in fact, there is empirical evidence linking the two. You can see that increases in response time lead to uh, decreases in the likelihood of crime, crime clearance. Uh, the sort of speculation on this is that it enables um, victim, or excuse me, witness identification, evidence collection, and that all kind of leads to greater chance of arrest. Interestingly, though, this is sort of flying in the face of traditional criminological theory, which suggests that unless police are responding incredibly quickly, like less than a minute, um, that may or may not, that probably doesn't have an impact on clearance rates. There's sort of two, there's not a clear um, conclusion on the relationship between response times and clearance rates, but we can say there's at least a correlation. We don't know if there's any causation. Um, and this is a point that was brought up a little bit earlier, um, and so I, I included this slide. Uh, you can see that um, from 2018 to last we had numbers in, in 2022, we've had about one officer per 10,000 citizens less based on adjusting um, the figures on per capita bases. Um, you can see in terms of raw numbers, there's been um, a little bit more significant decrease, but normalizing that to population, um, the, de the decline is a little bit less noticeable. All that to say and kind of repeat the same point that I made earlier, which is that I do think that MNPD staffing overall has a significant impact on response times, but I'm not willing to say that that is the main cause. I think that this is one piece in a much larger puzzle. And frankly, it's a, it's a piece and a puzzle that involves much more than MNPD. It involves a number of other departments, including the Department of Emergency Communications. So. I don't want the takeaway from this to be that there's a direct correlation between staffing and response times. I do think that it plays an important role. I, I didn't notice that in the original report. Was that NAD? It was in the previous response times report, and I included it in this presentation just to provide added context. And we've, we've touched on this as well, so I'll kind of breeze through this slide. The rule of 60 suggests that 60% of sworn officers in a department should be dedicated to patrol staffing and that they should not spend more than 60% of their time on calls for service. Um, looking at MMPD's numbers, again, they have 36% of their staff dedicated as patrol officers and an additional 12% dedicated to patrol supervision. And that does fly in the face of a DOJ report that came out that showed that about 62.5% of sworn officers in agencies of more than 100,000 residents are dedicated to patrol. And so, as we discussed earlier, major, major policing organizations really do caution against blanket metrics like the rule of 60. The rule of 60 is not going to work for every city. But on average, m many other departments across the country are dedicating more officers to patrol than Nashville is. Um, and that's probably a piece and perhaps a large piece in this puzzle that I've been discussing. I uh, already hit that first point, so I won't uh, belabor it. But because of that, I really do think it would be beneficial for MNPD to collaborate with an external organization, whether that be the city auditor's office, whether that be us, whether that be uh, an external consulting group, to just do basically a workload or a staffing analysis. Um, this is something that other police departments have done. The Kansas City Police Department did this in 2017. And they, they were able to really reallocate their officers. They were able to civilianize some officer duties, which allowed officers to focus more on patrol on investigation and on solving violent crime. So I think it's something for the department to consider. Um, since this is an informational report, I'm not gonna make a formal recommendation, but I do think it's something worthy of consideration. Moving on to caseloads, um, this was a factor that was brought up recently as potentially being the missing link between low clearance rates and uh, long response times. And research has validated the kind of common sense assumption that the odds of clearing a crime decrease as the number of open cases for an investigator increases. Said differently, departments uh, who are assigning, um, in, in this instance, in the FBI data we're looking at, investigators who handle five or more homicide cases have about 5% lower clearance rates compared to departments where uh, officers are looking at five or less cases per year. So that's going to kind of segue into our next section. Um, this is something that... Uh, Mr. DePriest worked on, and so I'm going to pass it over to him to discuss. 
Hello, everyone. Um, so first, we're going to take a look at what caseloads look like for the investigative units uh, within MNPD. So to start us off, we're going to break it down into bureau levels. So if you look at the blue side of the table, that's where we're looking at the Community Services Bureau. So this breakdown is really going to look, look at the officers in the geographic precincts around the city. So you can see the different breakdown of precincts and the respective units. We have the investigative units in each precinct and the CFIT unit in each precinct or the community field intelligence teams. And if you look to the right-hand side of the table, you'll be able to see how many officers, uh, investigative officers, that is, are um, stationed in each unit. And if you look at the orange side of the table, we have the Investigative Services Bureau. Um, was that a hand by? Oh. oh, I'm sorry. The orange side is the right-hand side. I'm not sure how well these colors uh, appear. Yeah, they're not showing up well. Um, so let me reframe that. So the first side, the Community Services Bureau side, is going to be on the left hand of the table, and the Investigative Services Bureau is going to be on the right hand of that table. And again, uh, like with the left hand side, if you look at the farthest right of the table, you'll be able to see the officers assigned to each investigative unit. All right, so now uh, let's look at the average caseload by investigative unit across MNPD. So uh, like that breakdown we just talked about before, this table is going to follow a similar breakdown starting at the top with MNPD as a whole, going down to the bureau level, and then going down into each precinct. Um, so you might notice that there are a range presented in this table when it comes to active caseloads, a range A at the bottom and range B at the top. The reason why we have a range is because in the information uh, that Commander Lara shared with us, there were some um, categories that were clear cut. These cases were active um, and currently you know, being worked upon and thought over. However, there was also a category, an other category, that included active cases in addition to cases that were either closed, suspended, or for other reasons put aside. So that category, because it still had some active cases, we couldn't completely count it out. So that's why we have um, that range. And in order to make it um, easier to read, we went ahead and added an average um, column at the very end of the table. So that average column averages um, range A and range B for active caseloads. And even though introducing a range intentionally introduces a little bit of statistical ambiguity, it's also how we can ensure that we're presenting the most accurate um, data since there is that uncertainty uh, in the original data presented to us. Um, so now when we actually look at the numbers, we can see on MNPD as an aggregate, there's about an average caseload of um, 40 or so active cases per officer. And when we look at the next level, the bureau level, we can already see some disparities uh, between the active caseload. With community services bureaus having around 100 or so active cases per officer compared to around 8.5 active, case, uh, active cases per officer in the investigative services bureau. All right. Let me ask you a question right there because, uh, and, and I don't know how it's structured, right? Okay, but uh, it, it looks like if it's, if it's community service, if it's community services bureau, they're actually out in precincts. Correct, and the number of investigators and cases per precinct, uh, whether whether it's uh, uh, CFIT or, or otherwise, is going to equal that 104 number. Is that is that right? That is correct. Okay. Yes. Now, why are there so? What, what does the Investigative Services Bureau do that 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 makes it, you know, with 217 investigators, you know, have uh, uh, 2,100 active cases as opposed to Community Services Bureau, which, you know, has many, many more and fewer people. I mean, wh wh what's going on? What does the Investigative Services Bureau do differently than the Community Services Bureau? 
Um, so that's a great question. And I'm actually going to go back to a phrase that um, Mr. Wynn used earlier, because I think it'll encapsulate this, uh, the answer to this question well, and that's the Investigative Services Bureau is a lot more centralized and a lot more specific than precincts, whereas precincts are going to get a lot of um, cases and incidents based just on like that whole geographic region. Investigative services are going to get a much more specialized caseload depending on the unit they're in um, across Nashville as a whole. So in that regard, they uh, since they have those more specialized caseloads kind of centralized across um, the whole city, they tend to have more officers. Um, trained in those specific cases, and since they're only receiving those specific cases, their average caseload looks a lot smaller than the Community Services Bureau, where they're given, you know, pretty much every single case in that geographic region. And if I may, just adding to, to that a little bit, when you're looking at sort of the org chart for MNPD, it's broken down. So under investigative services, um, there's the criminal investigation division, which does things like personal crimes, property crimes, and the FBI task force. You have a specialized investigations division, which is like the Titans section, um, interpersonal crimes branch, domestic violence division, and youth services division. Whereas when you're dealing with things more on a precinct level, it's going to be sort of any, any call that comes into that precinct is going to be a case assigned to that officer versus you know, a homicide case might get kicked from the precinct to a specific investigation. That's, I, I, you know, I'm sure, is it severity? <laughs> I mean, is it, is it tight? Don't worry about answering that. There's no answer. I'm just, I'm just saying it. I don't understand. Yes, please, Commander Laura. Thank you. So ISB, uh, Investigative Services Bureau, really deals with the most complex and most uh, in-depth, you know, homicides, uh, large scale cases where there are a lot more resources that are needed and a lot more focus on those specific cases. Uh, when you're talking about patrol, they're dealing with everything, you know, shoplifting, fraud, uh, cases that can be cleared pretty quickly. So it looks like it's a lot of cases, but a lot of those are not cases that are that in depth. They don't require as many resources. When you go to send a case to ISB, you know, ISB is, you know, has the criminal investigations division and the specialized investigation division. So you've got narcotics, you've got firearms, you've got homicide, you've got cold case. They're dealing with cases that are much more in depth, much more serious and require much more um, focus and resources. And so what they do is they really deal with those um, because they're such complex cases. Um, they, they can't have as many cases to, to look into because it's a lot of resources and a lot of uh, investigating that they're going to have to do on their own um, as long as well as they work with other precincts and work with other divisions and units mm -hmm. to get the information they need. Mm -hmm. But again, the real difference is the complexity of these cases. cases. Um, and also, yes, the, the major ones go into Investigative Services Bureau to be able to get the resources necessary to be able to investigate those. Thank so. you. Yes, um, great questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, continuing, so when we break that down further and look into geographic precincts, we can even see some disparities there uh, between different precincts as well. And then if you look at the bar graph on the right-hand side, that's pretty much displaying those average active caseloads by unit um, compared to each other. All right, so now let's take a look at clearance rates. Um, so like Gavin mentioned earlier, clearance rates um, are defined by the FBI's um, NIBRS database, and that is the same standard that MNPD uh, uses to determine clearance rates, um, as that is the national standard for police precincts across the country. And uh, the FBI's database defines clearance rates uh, simply as cleared cases as a percentage of total cases. Um, so here, we didn't need to introduce a range. We had um, a much simpler data set to use for this. So we simply measured cleared cases versus total cases um, to calculate that clearance rate at the right-hand um, side of the table. 
So um, similar to the last uh, table we just looked at, here we see MNPD has an average of about 18% uh, clearance rate across the board, mm -hmm. but that average does not uh, remain sustained when you look at the next level. So clearance rates between the Community Service Bureau and the Investigative Services Bureau have a pretty wide um, disparity as well, around 10% you know, mm -hmm. for the Community Services Bureau mm -hmm. and around 38% mm -hmm. for the Investigative mm -hmm. Services now, now, Bureau. Now, Dylan, one of the things that stood out to me, uh, you know, particularly at the precinct level, at the Madison precinct, uh, I'm going to call that one out, there were, there were more cases at Madison than at any other precinct, okay? And they had a higher clearance rate. Well, I should say, wait, there were 491 at the Madison precinct? Is that correct? That's cleared cases. In terms of total cases, I'm Madison sorry, has a lower cases. number. Clear cases, all right? And the clearance rate was the highest rate at, of any other precinct? Is that is that correct? Am I looking at that right? The yes. The par right? Okay. I, I'm like, is that because the lab's there? No, I'm just kidding in a way. But I mean, seriously, that's, that's quite a disparity. And is there any kind of insight you can give us into that? Yes, um, not at this moment. I think that's ground for really interesting further research, looking at maybe the demographics, the resources, the um, supportive services for MNPD uh, within each unit, I think are all, or within each precinct rather, are all really interesting questions that we can look at for why these differences might exist between precincts. Um, but right now, we don't have any data to really soundly make any judgment based on that. And I noticed in your report that uh, looking at demographics as to cause, if you will, initiation of cases and things of that sort and how they responded to might give us further insight. My question to you, not, not, not about that definitively now, but is, are these, is that demographic information available? It is. Um, so this is, I'm not sure how much I should um, say on it because I don't know if it's like an official project yet, um, but I've been working on, I don't know if anyone is familiar with ArcGIS. Yes. It, yes. Yeah. Um, so using ArcGIS, um, we've created um, kind of a display of Nashville divided by the MNPD precincts and then have been able to link that to census track data. Um, and census tract data is really useful because it provides pretty much an infinite source of information, whether you're looking at uh, racial or ethnic, ethnicity information, um, poverty or income level, any uh, educational attainment, even really any kind of qualifier you might be interested in studying is available in, in so, so, so you can make assumptions based upon the demographics of a census tract, but let me ask you this. Are incidents that are reported, okay, categorized by uh, race, ethnicity, and gender? So there's, there's kind of two answers to that. One is that the data that we currently have is not at all broken down in terms of, of what you were just asking. The second part of that answer is I do believe that information is captured. Um, I think that were we interested in doing that, we would probably have to make public records requests. I don't think that's information that we get currently shipped out to us by MNPD, but it, it is something that we could consider, but it would require that extra step. And uh, just one quick other point. Um, generally, in, in the literature, you find that property crimes are cleared at much lower rates than violent crimes. And so that really does support kind of what we were talking about earlier. That's why the Investigative Services Bureau has such a higher clearance rate because they are dealing with those more violent crimes, whereas precinct level investigators are often dealing with crimes that have clearance rates in the single digits, um, which is why you see such different numbers here. And I see Mr. Wynn. Yeah, can I add to that? There, there is, a, and that was what I wanted to bring up, the difference between personal and property crime clearances. With property crime clearances, you could clear 20 residential burglaries with one arrest. That's normal. That's not abnormal, or car burglary. So, there, and you can clear cases by exception 
with no information, no fingerprints, no evidence, easier than you can a personal crime where somebody's been raped. So that there are differences when you compare the two. I know you look at both. You have to manage that in. And the other thing I want to just real quick I want to go back to, to make the point about minimum staffing patrol, if cases are cleared, the command of Laura mentioned this, if they're cleared by arrest by per patrol response, that means they're, they're, not, they're not needy cases where it has to be handed off to detective for further investigation. The case is cleared. The, and the case managers in the detectives bureaus, the sergeants and lieutenants look at it and say, we're moving this out of the way. We're spending, we only have a limited amount of time. We're not going to investigate those cases. So patrol actually takes the burden off of more intensive preventative work by a detective. Is that, you agree with that? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, um, so going back to average caseloads um, versus clearance rates. So as you might have noticed from the past two tables we were looking at, the units that tended to have a lower average caseload appeared to have higher clearance rates as well. So in order to test this hypothesis, we graphed those two variables against each other. Um, and while our data set wasn't large enough to necessarily make a statistical determination, we can clearly see here a relationship uh, between active caseloads and clearance rates with those units that had that lower um, active caseload having higher clearance rates. And then as you move um, over across the table by increasing active caseload, you can see the trend of that clearance rate going down with it. Thank you. No. It was a great comment. Thank you. All right. So just wrapping up a little bit, we've talked a lot about a, a, a variety of different factors. It's, it's really unlikely that increasing response times are due to any one of them in particular. It's probably all of the things we've discussed and much, much more. Um, but what we can really say is that the increase in response times is coupled with a decrease in clearance rates and very disparate caseloads and clearance rates across precincts. And there is literature that's suggested that there is some sort of relationship between all of them. So that leaves us with a ton of questions um, regarding EMS call structure, patrol officer staffing, uh, call prioritization, differential clearance rates, um, that desire for a workload or a staffing analysis, and then just generally kind of a community perception from whether their needs are being met by MNPD in terms of these long response times. Um, so we think this is an area that's ripe for a ton of research. This is really just the tip of the iceberg, um, but we thought it was an important topic and, and really wanted to present it to you. So we have references here, but they're also all in your the handouts that you have. So if there are any further questions, we will take them now. Just fantastic information, fantastic uh, uh, approach. I, I'd like to uh, suggest that what we consider further, you know, be a subject of discussion at this board uh, as, as far as pursuing maybe some more in-depth answers uh, to some of the questions that have been raised today. Uh, and, and as they're enumerated in the, in the last paragraph, I, I would uh, suggest that uh, maybe I'll get with the executive director and kind of try to prioritize, you know, which of those uh, might be pursued because I know that you, that's what you need is another thing to do. <laughs> So uh, I definitely, <laughs> that's Just why I want to be cautious <laughs> and, 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 and say I want to work with the ED on that one. And the one on demographics especially, you know, uh, is of interest uh, uh, for, 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 for me personally. So I, I appreciate the work. And, and like board member Wynn, I, I trust that in the PD is, is not tracking your, your, your reports here and thinking that they're going to take you from us. So. Uh, <laughs> That'd be a great loss. We appreciate that. Thank I, you. Yeah, yeah. Did we have something on LPRs? Okay. Um, would you like to continue? I believe that was going to be brought up in new business. So if we're transitioning to that, we, we can talk about it. Unless you have something further to add on the previous item? I don't. All right. Let's go to new business. All right. Uh, then I'm going to ask Commander Lara to come up. I know that he's received some information that um, you wanted to share great with us. Great job, and, and then we can kind of talk through any further questions that we might have. 
And we're talking about license plate readers. Welcome, Commander Lord. Thank you, uh, sir. Okay, so just a little information on the, the pilot program. The, just a, first, a little back information. The LPR program commenced on January 23rd per the, per the ordinance, allowing every aspect of the program to be implemented, including LPR equipment to be placed in the different locations around the county. Um, so that's where it started. So uh, after or on or after uh, January 23rd, uh, we had vendors come up and they started to place um, their equipment uh, LPR uh, cameras at different locations uh, around, sorry, different locations around the city. Uh, general loca location, I'm sorry, general location placement can be found on the LPR website uh, over at national.gov on the police website. It's important to note that signage will be clearly placed by any LPR technology to give notice it is being utilized. So wherever you see these cameras, there should be a sign there that shows that it is being utilized there. The actual monitoring program will go live tomorrow, uh, February 23rd. And that's when we're gonna actually start reviewing and having our personnel review and monitor the cameras and the footage that comes through those cameras. Uh, the department has been using the time between January 23rd, which is the commencement, um, and February 23rd, tomorrow, the monitoring start, to train all the personnel up uh, who are gonna be involved in the pilot program. Multiple vendors uh, are being used to see which LPR technology will best meet the needs of the city and the department. So we don't have any specific vendor right now that we're using. Uh, we have several vendors that have um, asked to be a part of this pilot program so that they can uh, showcase their technology. Uh, we are using uh, all of those. Um, the vendors are providing their LPRs to test during the pilot, pilot period. Once the pilot program uh, is completed, the vendors will go, then go into the procurement process through the procurement department. Uh, so any questions that has to do with funding or anything like that, we'll have to go through procurement directly. Uh, I, yes, sir, absolutely. Um, I couldn't tell you, I, I just know that the vendors are, from what I understand, the vendors that have the cameras, and I don't know what that entails, it may be both, a combination of both, uh, but I know that those who have cameras that they want us to use um, are the ones that are uh, being utilized around the city. So it could be a combination of both. I'm not exactly sure how the LPR cameras work. And I can't say this with 100% confidence, but generally hardware and software are maintained by the same company. Um, so likely it will be the same people, but I can't say with 100% certainty. Okay, so as far as multiple vendors are concerned, they're just kind of looking in and trying to get a, a feel for how they might respond to a, a, a request for proposal. Not necessarily they have equipment on the ground, or do they have equipment on the ground, multiple I'll, I'll let you answer that, Commander Lara. Sure, so yes, they have equipment that they have placed in those locations for the pilot program itself. So the cameras that we are be utilizing right now that are beginning with the program are, or that are beginning with a pilot program are cameras that these different vendors have have uh, offered to the, the department to see, hey, this is, our, uh, this is our technology. Let's see if it works during this pilot program. If you want, then we're gonna go ahead and, and see if we can get the contract, I, see. Uh, I so, guess would say. So they're, 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 they're maintaining the data on separate servers. Uh, again, all the, techno the technical part of it, I can't tell you exactly. I can tell you that they're- My point, I'm just wondering, I'm wondering how are you going to get comprehensive results with multiple vendors, across multiple vendors who probably don't have the kind of API that allows them to talk to one another? So well, I, I mean, that's not a question sure. for you. It's just a question I have. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering how that's going to work. Does it, that could create some complexities. So I don't know how the interaction with the, the cameras and the system works uh, when it comes to all the different vendors working together. But I'm assuming that if they're allowing them to have a camera out there, that it is compatible with whatever program we are using to monitor them. So again, I that's something I can speak to IT and get a little bit cl love to know clearer more about information that. Just on for, that. Just from a technical standpoint, I'd love to know sure. more about that. Thank you. Yes, and sir. I think I have a question in regards to that. So we know that you guys have like a body-worn camera unit to specifically work with body-worn cameras and it's, you know, just a few people. Like who's actually monitoring um, and working with this data that's being like collected? I'm assuming since you already have cameras already actively working, um, in our city, like who is monitoring that data collection? Um, and also the fact that um, the data collection of, uh, based on what the ordinance says, um, it's supposed to like expire within the 10 days. Like where's that information going? Where is it stored? And like who in the department is responsible for this license plate reader uh, information? Sure. 
Uh, great question. So um, we have specific people that have been designated, have been vetted to go ahead and do this and have been training from the inception January 23rd of this program until tomorrow where they're, they, it's actually going to go live. So at this time, nobody's monitoring anything. Um, because we haven't trained anybody up. Tomorrow, the department has chosen tomorrow, giving up time from the inception till tomorrow to be able to get everybody trained up. Tomorrow, we will begin the live monitoring. Um, and yes, as uh, as director said, there's a 10-day period where after 10 days, the information will not be retained anymore. How that technical part of that works, I'm not sure, but I can tell you that um, the information should only be retained for 10 days per the ordinance. Uh, so after, on the 11th day, whatever was there, is gone. Um, so, and again, I, I don't know how that technical part of it works, but it, it is there. Um, we do have a captain, uh, Stephen Duncan, who is over the LPR program, and he's just kind of overseeing everything and making sure that um, all the, 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 the I's are dotted and the, the T's are crossed, but um, it is a IT program. They're the ones who are going to be really focusing on it since they're the, the technical minds behind all that. I don't know. Well, no, if, if, it's, if, there's, if, it's, if it's under an investigation, yeah. it has an additional amount of time. Like, oh, uh, okay. Oh, oh, sure. Okay. So just in, so you know, it's 10, per the ordinance, it's 10 days if there's no, I guess, evidentiary Gas. value to it. Um, after that, if it is part of investigation or crime, then it will be retained as indefinitely. But if it is, there is nothing that we're going to be able to do with that other than, you know, it's just, it ran somebody's tag. Um, and it's, that tag was not put in the system as a tag that we're looking for, I guess you could say. Then it would, after 10 days, it would, you know, I don't know exactly how the technical part of it works, but it will not be retained in the system. Anything else that we say, yes, that tag was involved, there's a vehicle that was involved in a crime, that could be saved in the system and, and it'll be retained as long as necessary for the, for the investigation, if that makes sense. Uh, of, 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 a, of a license plate reading camera can be found online? So the if you go onto our LPR website, okay. they have quadrants on okay. there. Which, How do I get to it if uh, I'm the public? How do I get to it? I mean, it, do I go to Nashville.gov and then go, or go to MMPD and... I mean, is there a specific website? How do I, how, do I, how does the public know where those cameras are going to be? Yeah. I mean, I have a link that I can read out, um, but it's it's under the, the police department's website under crime control strategies. There's, crime control strategies. There's a, another subsection for license plate reader pilot program. Okay, license plate reader pilot program. Okay. And right there, it's kind of, I can figure it out from there as far as where the locations are. So I can say, I, I actually was looking at it. All you have to do is type in Metro Nashville LPR program and it'll actually pop up the link. So if you Boom. just, if you Google it and just put Metro it. Nashville LPR program, Boom. the link will actually pop That's up good. as one of the ones That's you good. can just click I on it. I can do that. And I it's easy. So, okay, great. Thank you. In case you can't go through there, it can be a little confusing at times. Thank so you. I have sure. homework. You got it. For tonight. Yes, sir. <laughs> Please continue. On. Sorry, just, just to, to push a little more on that specific question. So the website has for specific four quadrants um the lprs are going to be distributed equitably across those four quadrants um there's like a little informational video on there it seems like there's going to be about 40 lprs installed in the pilot program i don't believe and you can correct me if i'm wrong commander um that we have those 40 locations at this moment at this time i don't believe that they're put out yet and i believe that they're maybe still even putting some of those lprs out i'm not exactly sure but i can tell you that um if that isn't needed, I'm sure that we can probably provide that. Um, and again, it's it's every one of those LPRs that's put out there will have a sign, you know, saying it's being used wherever it's being, you know, where it's being posted. So, yes, sir. Now active that have been posted or put up since January the 23rd. I cannot tell you how many are actively up, um, okay. but we were looking at I think what they said was about 40. So I'm assuming that they've started working on putting those up. I'm not sure if they've all been put up already, um, but whatever's being put up has been put up. We're going to start monitoring tomorrow. Okay. So okay. I'll just say that. Uh, 
I couldn't tell you that's something that you'd have to ask procurement, sir. Thank you. Well, I don't know that they are here in Nashville, but uh, common vendors would be Flock or Vigilant that I would suspect are being used, but it doesn't sound like we have a clear answer on that right now. To that policy did, did, did we yes you did sir so um, what the request was if, if you want to review the policy that we have if you want us to make any changes please send up those requests and we will uh, the, the department will look into making any any changes or any uh, co uh, recommendations that you make okay and staff we received that and we've made our comments we we have received that and in the packet that you had on your your table today you'll you'll find a policy that we have formulated as a department um, we haven't taken the next steps, but I, the next steps will involve reaching out to MNPD and trying to hammer through some of the points that we want that they don't have. Um, and so it's, it's an ongoing process. I'll read it tonight. Okay, great. Quick question. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Right turn. On the authorized and prohibited uses, um, what kind of raised me on D and uh, A, um, letter D, that is also going to be monitoring reckless driving, uh, illegal drag racing activities at speeds and access, uh, excess of 70 miles per hour. Then in four, uh, detecting traffic offenses. So it is, so the LPR is really expanding more than just reading license plates. They're actually looking at speeds. And um, I think I was kind of thought it was just specifically for. Um, you know, license plates, but it's, it is from this is going to be checking speeds or detecting traffic offenses. And so that this is, if it's on this paper, I'm assuming this is what it's going to be doing. I want to definitely make the, the public know about that. I know this might be online or whatever, but uh, what, I don't know, what kind of change to add that in the LPR program? So if I could, so the LPR program, the, 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 the cameras don't, from what I understand, they don't detect speed. They're not speed, you know, they're not speed detecting devices. What they're doing is they're reading the license plates that are there. So if there's a specific vehicle that um, was involved in a crime that we're looking for, we will put an information into the system and then the system will, if, if that camera hits on that tag that's specifically put in there, it will alert that, hey, this tag you were looking for, it is here. Um, from what I understand, and again, I, I don't have all the details of it, but I, I do not believe that this is, this is not a, a, a technology that we're using to detect speeds or anything. We're just literally looking for specific vehicles involved in specific crimes, and those cars, those, those tags are tags that we actually put in into the system so that it will search for them. Okay. So if, if I don't put the tag in there, it's not gonna hit on it because there's no reason for it to be hitting on it. But if I say, hey, this tag, you know, uh, Commander Lara was involved in a crime. This is his tar his car tag. They will put it in the system, and then if it if I go by one of these LPRs and it hits my tag and it says, "Yep, that's Carlos's uh, vehicle," then it will send that information to those who are monitoring it. Gotcha. So it's kind of like sense. so from this, it's not going to be detecting speed. It's just going to be really specifically for license mm -hmm. plates. But for this, if an officer sees a a or couldn't get to reckless driving, um, mm -hmm. the drag streak racing, mm -hmm. sure. the, the uh, performance-based drag racing, the circles and all of those things, or they was noted of a traffic offense that they didn't, didn't I don't know, didn't get the, the license, or I would assume they got the license plate, but didn't follow up or didn't go after or lost track, then that would be put in, so it's really not monitoring. So I just want clarification on this because what from the, the um, black and white, it, it appears that it's going to be monitoring reckless drivers. So, so it's, it's, it's not monitoring reckless driving, but it can be utilized to, um, to detect vehicles that have been used in reckless driving if we put the, the tag in there. So again, if it's one of those where we had a bunch of cars, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they had a bunch of cars that were, you know, drag racing and, and also, uh, you know, driving recklessly on Bell Road and Murfreesboro. They say we had two or three of those cars. Okay, we know that these were the three cars that had, that were causing the most issues or that they were, you know, they're breaking the law. These are the three tags that we want to go and these are the three cars we want to find. We will put those three tags in the, in the uh, system and then 
if those tags are detected by an LPR, it will go ahead and send that information to those who are monitoring it. So again, it's not going to detect or bring up anything that we haven't put into it to find. Because if not, it's just reading, it's just reading tags, it's just numbers and letters. Okay. But once we have one that says this is a sequence that we're looking for in this tag, if it hits on that tag and that sequence, it's going to go, hey, this is the one you were looking for for whatever crime it was committed, and that'll send that information to the monitor, the, the officer's monitoring, and they'll be able to use that to you know, further the investigation. Okay. I just if want that, clarification. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just want okay. clarification because from the reading of it, it's, it looks like it's going to be monitoring mm -hmm. speed yeah. and traffic offender, but it's really just specifically for, I want to make sure that it's clear, specifically just for license plate and license plate only. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. One of the questions that I had, and then I'm, I'm not going to ask anymore, is I know that we're talking about fixed license plate readers and, you know, um, as well as like mobile, you know, stations or whatever you want to call them, mobile devices on us, you know. Um, but the cars are outfitted with license plate readers as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I was wondering if, um, if you're using those now, would those be included in this pilot program as well? Because we know that the Motorola system that you're using through WatchGuard can, you know, convert to uh, license plate readers through change of, you know, including the software. And so would you, I guess that brings my question to, and you probably won't know the answer to this, but would you use license plate readers in the vehicles under one particular um, you know, manufacturer and then use something else for the fixed. But also, when you're talking about this pilot program, are you also including the license plate readers that are included in the vehicles? So we're, uh, what I would refer to as the ordinance. Whatever the ordinance is stating, and I believe the ordinance says fixed, uh, from what I understand, I believe. Um, I don't believe that we have anything that says in there that I, I have read, and again, I may have missed it, um, that it is mobile. But I will say that we are going to... Um, we're going to make sure that we are uh, in accordance, working in accordance with what the, the, the uh, ordinance says. And so if the ordinance says that you can use both, at this point, we're, not, we're looking at these fixed LPRs, and that's what we're looking at right now. If that is going to expand because the ordinance allows it, that's something that you know, the, the, the department will look into. But at this time, that I understand, that I know of, we're just focusing on these fixed readers that we have put out in the LPR, um, you know, website uh, at these four different quadrants and these 40, I guess, or so uh, that are fixed with the sign on there. Apart from that, I have no idea and I do not believe that we're, that we, that that's even been looked into because again, we're going by directly by what the ordinance and the, what the, the ordinance has given us authority to use. And I believe it's just fixed. And so if it's not in the ordinance, we're not doing it. It's pretty, pretty basic on that. Anything further? Anything further? All right, well, great. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Mr. Williamson, do you have anything further? Any other reports? I, nope. Okay. Kept All you till right. 8 o'clock anyways, though. All Sorry. Right. We were right up to 8 here. <laughs> but uh, you have something? Yes. Uh, okay. Executive Director okay. Fitcher. Uh, and so in closing, um, I did receive something today um, sh from the uh, from one of our board members in regards to the IACP and police oversight. Um, and that I thought that I would share this with you all. Um, and it's in support of the acceptance of oversight. It is from the IACP. The International Association of of chiefs of police, chiefs of police. Um, and okay. so it came from in August 2021 there was this was a caption inside of um, the chief the po the police chief magazine it mm -hmm. says by acting as an independent and neutral entity reviewing the work of law enforcement agency and its sworn staff a civilian oversight agency offers us a unique type of legitimacy as compared to internal accountability and review mechanisms similarly civilian oversight's impartiality neutrality and adherence to findings the fact can help to mitigate officer skepticism in internal systems and bolster procedural fairness within the law enforcement agency. And then there was another one. Um, can, it, the caption was, can professional civilian oversight improve community police relations? And, and, and what they said was, professional civilian oversight of law enforcement agencies can tr transform organizational culture in a positive way. Changes in technology, widespread access to the internet, smartphones, 24-7 access to continual loops of news and organized activism are just a few of the factors nudging law enforcement toward the future of professional civilian oversight. These factors, combined with the complex societal issues with which the police are tasked to deal, are creating an atmosphere ripe for change. 
Law enforcement agencies, though, have often resisted civilian oversight. Across the United States, however, policing has changed and professional civilian oversight could be exactly what is needed to regain legitimacy, boost morale, increase the hiring of diverse candidates, and improve public safety. So, just wanted to share that with you all. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Board Member Wynn. Yeah, and just to follow on to that, thank you, uh, Director Fitchard. Um, and then I want to thank you for the last two years. I've sat in these meetings and I've watched your staff and your and your members of, of your your group produce professional publications and studies that are all based on national standards for law enforcement management. Um, most coming from IACP, the largest law enforcement organization in the world. Uh, so I agree. Um, they would not have put that article that you just read in Police Chief Magazine if they didn't believe it. They have 30,000 members worldwide, so they set the gold standard for law enforcement nationwide and worldwide. So as somebody who has worked uh, as a trainer and consultant for ICP since 1988, and still do today, um, I want to echo what they've said. Uh, and what they, what they promote with their leadership in law enforcement across the country. I didn't know what to expect when I got on this board two years ago, uh, but I was open-minded about oversight. And since then, you know, I've interacted with my peers who work in this field, and they tell me, and I agree, that community and civilian oversight is part of the of structure of modern 21st century policing. You cannot move forward in law enforcement without the trust of the community who funds you day in, day out. It just doesn't work. Oversight is the glue that brings these two communities together. And I say that not just somebody who worked for the Metro Police Department for several years, but somebody who has had family members continuously and actively serving in law enforcement in Tennessee since 1948. Uh, I've, the sixth generation of my family is in a police academy right now in Dallas, Texas. There are me seven or eight more, I would imagine, in my family. So my view on this, uh, for anybody who's interested in listening to this, is that uh, before you sever the relationship between the taxpayers of this city and their police department that they support and they fund, you should come and talk to us on this oversight board. On this board are decades of law enforcement experience. What happens in this room every month is not a group of angry citizens who are ranting and screaming and raving about the police department. That's not what happens here. We're raising the standard of the Metro Police Department, which is our right to do as taxpayers. And I think if the wise men and women of the state legislature um, did it right, the Tennessee way, they would come here and talk to us before they made a decision about doing away with the voice of the taxpayers of Nashville. So I just wanted to echo what Director Fitcher said and just uh, ask you as our, uh, as our chair to invite the legislators who are considering such a drastic move that would deprive the citizens of Nashville their right to have a say in their police function day in and out in Nashville. Absolutely, consider it done, we shall do that. Thank you. And uh, we've also been invited by at least one legislator to kind of come and let them know what our perspective is. So your, your, your request is right on time and expands that uh, to where we can have even more of an impact. I appreciate your words and your service. Thank you. Anything further? Uh, Judge Brown. One, uh, oh, uh, 631, the, as follows, the COB requests that the Metropolitan National Police Department uh, advise the COB for the basis for policy 16.10.040 paragraph D parentheses five, that a citation will be issued for juvenile traffic offenses and the possibility of removing this limitation and that the Metropolitan Police Department consider issuing an apology to the complainant and daughter in that case. 
in that in that uh, proposal. I've got it in writing. Uh, Second. It's been moved uh, <clears throat> outside of the item discussion and properly seconded. Um, is there is there any further dis is there discussion questions? It is board members right before we adjourn to bring that to the floor. <clears throat> all right, uh, all in favor, let it be known by the sign aye. aye. Opposed say no. Okay, staff is so instructed. All right, is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.